Hi, and welcome to the first Solution Summit, where we will start creating solutions to one of our country's greatest challenges, the issue of immigration. Um, I'm Gregory Kallenberg. I am the founder and producer of The Rational Middle of Immigration. We are a film and media company focused on helping create discussions and solutions to divisive and polarizing issues like the one we're tackling today. You can see the Rational Middle of Immigration films and be a part of the discussion at rationmiddle.com and on Twitter and Facebook. And just so you know, these films that you're about to see today and also that you can visit um, at rationalmiddle.com slash immigration have been seen and shared over three and a half million times and really have become a powerful and, and, and driving voice towards uh, the immigration issue and certainly towards the solution again that we're gonna be working on today together here. Um, before um, I uh, jump into the Solution Summit and we jump into these panels, I wanna thank you all for being a part of this. Um, we have a packed digital house from all over the country. Um, I'm looking at the list right now and people uh, starting to stack themselves into this event. Thank you all for being here. Um, our goal is to convene leaders from the community, from academia, policymakers in the corporate world. And we've certainly done that today and you should all be applauded for being here and being a part of this important discussion and activation towards a solution. As we go through this, this event, please engage, uh, be a part of the conversation, stack in questions if that is uh, something that is interesting to you and you certainly wanna be a part of, of activating and, and really engaging in this discussion because really and truly the hive mind and the collective effort is how we're going to resolve this immense challenge. Um, I also want to uh, thank the sponsors of today's event and also the uh, groups of, uh, that are associated with our panelists today. Again, everyone that you're gonna hear on this list were important and instrumental to this uh, Solution Summit happening today. Uh, I would like to thank the American Immigration Lawyers Association, Americans for Prosperity, Baker Ripley, Center for Houston's Future, Center for the United States and Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy, Foster LLP, ideaspace.com, the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, the Migra Migration Policy Institute, the National Immigration Forum, or immigration law firm PC, Stan Merrick, and the Merritt Brothers. Um, I thank you all for everything that you guys have done to really make this possible today because this gathering is incredibly important to the issue and also moving the issue forward towards a solution. Um, I'd now like to uh, bring up someone who is incredibly special to the rational middle. Uh, not as, only is he a benefactor to us and to the series and the podcast and everything that we do, but but Stan Merrick is somebody who walks a walk and talks a talk. And he's, he's certainly put his money where his mouth is and, and done it in a way that is robust and is driving the issue forward towards what we believe is going to be a solution. Also, Stan Merrick is somebody who is a, a strong voice who has advocated for immigration reform for a very, very long time. Um, so that said, I'm honored and excited to bring up to the virtual stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stan Merrick. Well, thank you, Gregory, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm, I'm, so many of you are friends and we've fought this battle for a long time. It's good to be with you virtually. And uh, it has been a long battle. And, and with mine, it's very personal because as an employer, uh, for the last 30 years, uh, we have built our workforce uh, with Latinos, and 85% uh, of our workforce, of, of a few thousand, are Latinos, and they're great workers, great people, and uh, there's so many out there that want to come to work for us that we can't hire because of their legal status, and in the construction industry, unfortunately, it has become the easiest place for an undocumented worker to find work because he can work as an independent subcontractor and not be part of a payroll, a W-2 payroll as we call them. No social security, no workman's cop, no safety training, and, and no career. And, and we're doing ourselves a disservice as well as them because in my opinion, that is not sustainable. And, and if we're gonna build this country, our in infrastructure, all the buildings we need, uh, we need, we need workers who are, who are legal workers, who are employees, who can be trained, who can learn safety, 
and who can you know raise families and and not be in poverty the whole time. So uh, I love what Gregory and Lauren and Chris and the team are doing at the Rational Middle. Uh, we have a completely gridlocked Congress, uh, even under the new administration. That has not changed. Uh, these bills, as simple as DACA is, uh, is it going to happen? I'd be very surprised. Uh, the only thing these politicians are going to understand is grassroots support. We need to educate and empower our voters uh, via these videos, via these podcasts, to learn what's right and wrong about immigration. And we're also providing cover for our elected officials uh, who will eventually realize that they've got to take a stand and do what's right for our country, not what's right for them to be reelected. So I'm uh, encouraged with events like this going on all over the country with other groups as well. Uh, we believe in collaboration. We believe in working with everybody. Our videos are free to the world. And, and I, instead of three and a half million, I want 35 million views uh, in, in the next six months. So Gregory, so you got your work cut out for you, but thank you for letting me be here. And I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's comments today. Thanks, Dan. Um, that is uh, incredible words, um, inspiring and certainly driving us forward as, as you start putting out numbers like 35 million. But, but I will tell you that again, you can go to rashmetal.com, you can see the films and you can share and you can also engage in those discussions. Um, it's an important part of what we do and that grassroots approach is certainly where we're heading for being in the community meeting, the policy meeting and the corporate meeting, which again, starts in places uh, like what we're doing here today at the Rash Middle of Immigration Solutions Summit. Up next is um, our uh, Solutions Summit keynote. I want to turn it over to our executive producer, Lauren Steffi. Hello, and welcome to the Rational Middle of Immigration Summit keynote address. I'm executive producer Lauren Steffi, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today author D.W. Gibson. D.W., thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. Now, you are the author of this uh, really great book called 14 Miles, which looks at a very specific stretch of border uh, in southern San Diego County. And we'll get into a little bit in, in a minute as to why you chose that particular area. But one of the things you said early on in the book was that uh, you said, I've been searching for a way to figure out what a border really looks like in an increasingly interconnected world. So I'm wondering if you found any answers or what did you find out as you as you worked your way through the project? Yeah, so uh, I think the point of origin was in the last project I was doing, which was about uh, gentrification, how a, a city or a community changes when a bunch of money rolls into town. And as I was talking to people about that topic, uh, the, the, the matter of sort of lines and borders that we draw for ourselves in our daily lives, it kept coming up in conversations. People would talk about, oh, I sort of stay on this side of town because, right? This is my side of the block because, right? And people had these organizing principles in their lives. And I, I got curious about those. And I wondered what those look like as they telescope out uh, to more and more substantial and meaningful lines. And, and what does that mean for us as a country in terms of our national borders? How do those lines help define us? And I also had a sense that, you know, as we sit in our homes in, in Texas and Nebraska and Iowa and sort of different parts of the country, we have um, an idea of, of what the border looks like in our minds, a sort of straight line on the map. And so I wanted to compare that, that visual that most of us have in our minds with what it actually looks like on the ground and uh, what it looks like for the people who encounter the border in their daily lives, those who cross it daily for work, those who live around it. Um, and really what I discovered, which surprises no one who, who knows the border well, is that it's, a, it's an ecosystem of human activity. Uh, it, is, it is a busy area. It is a region. Uh, that brings uh, jobs and schools and artists and people from every walk of life. It brings all the complications that you see in every small town or big town community in terms of uh, issues with in environment, issues with uh, uh, income inequality. Um, all of these issues that we deal with in sort of uh, communities across the country are definitely found in this ecosystem of human activity, the border. You have a line early in the book, and you actually are, are talking about the 8 Freeway, which is kind of a border in its own right. But uh, one of the things you say is, I have discovered that clean lines generally mark the most complicated places. And it struck me that, you know, that could be an analogy, obviously, for the border overall, but, but also for our entire immigration system. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I highlight the eight freeway there. So my book is really focused on the San Diego Tijuana region and San Diego County is what I really looked at precisely because to look at a you know 2000 mile border would have been overwhelming and I needed to find a place to focus on. And it was interesting to see in San Diego County that, you know, one of the defining characteristics for so many people there are, are in fact, the, the highway systems, the freeway systems, right? And people often relate to each other uh, in terms of morning commutes and regular uh, journeys that they make. And the 8 freeway is known to everybody in San Diego County. It sort of slices the county right in half. It's about 15 miles north of the border and runs parallel to the border. And I make a case that in some ways, the 8 Freeway is in fact the, the international border in so many ways, because historically, so much of the policy in San Diego County and California and in the country has marginalized the people that live south of the freeway. It's, it's mainly uh, people of color, uh, black and brown communities. Um, and then you find a lot more affluence, a lot more white communities north of the 8 Freeway. And so I think that that's instructive, again, to see this fact that, you know, we, we have these lines that define us. We, we use them in our daily lives. And I think that's important to keep track of, because I think for people who live far away from the border, it's easy for it to feel uh, mythologized or, or um, unreal in a way. But I think it traces back to sort of these, these markers we all use to define ourselves in our daily lives. And I definitely saw that in San Diego County. Now, you use the uh, the prototypes for the wall that the Trump administration wants to build as sort of a narrative anchor for the book. You kind of come back to their progress, uh, and, you know, throughout the entire project. And I don't want to give away the ending, but you know, you are writing nonfiction, so we do sort of know how it turns out. And I, I mean, I was left with a sense of incredible futility. I mean. You share all these really great stories, but at the end of the day, it's hard to figure out, you know, what was all this disruption and, and upheaval really about? It's it's a really good question. So, yeah, and, and people might not remember that in the fall of 2017, the Trump administration uh, had uh, $20 million initially allocated to build eight models of what a border wall could look like. And they were lined up like beauty uh, pageant contestants, right? Um, and in the end, uh, none of those models were used. The, the models that have been used for the construction that's taken place since then were the model that was put in place during the Obama administration, these sort of 30 foot, generally 30 feet high steel ballards with, with uh, metal sheets up top. Um, so it was, in a way, it was all a, a theatrical exercise. I think that, you know, that point you made brings up two things for me, really. One is that the border is this place where that's made for theater in a way. I mean, think about more recent images of politicians going down there in bulletproof vests to look at things and sort of wading into the weeds and near the river. Um, you know, it's a place that sort of um, uh, symbolizes the way we feel about so many other big issues that actually don't track back to the border. So many immigration issues track back to San Salvador or to Washington, D.C. or to labor issues. Um, but we use the border as that physical space um, to represent how we feel about immigration issues, right? And so that's why it's so ripe for, I think, theatrics. The other thing that's related to what you, you said in terms of nothing really going anywhere with the prototypes, you know, not only did they not use those models, but they tore them down quickly and essentially one day, very unceremoniously. In fact, they told reporters they were going to start around 1030, but they got started a few hours earlier than that. And um, I, I think there were several reasons why they took the, the prototypes down. But the main reason is the exact spot where they were building those prototypes. What are they building now? They're building a port of entry. They're building a port of entry and not just any port of entry, but a commercial port of entry, right? Yeah. One that's designed for 18 wheelers that can bring products that are coming from Aquila Doras, the factories that are right by the border in Tijuana where American companies can, can build goods for uh, less expensive labor, skip out on some duties and taxes and uh, bring those products into the U.S. as part of NAFTA and the follow-up agreement, right? And so there's a shortage of, of commercial ports in San Diego County. They need more space for all those products to come to American shelves. And so they're building a new port of entry right there. And I think that just speaks to so many of the issues that I saw at the border. One, that this sort of idea of the wall in many ways is false and theatrical. And two, what it really comes down to a lot of the times is commerce and, and globalized capitalism and, and finding ways to, to, to have products move more freely. And, and the fact that they're building a commercial port of entry there right now just underscores the point that it's so much easier in the modern world for 
products to cross international borders than it is for the people who make those products. That is so interesting. Uh, I'm wondering what lessons from your book could be applied to the current situation? I mean, after all, the border is once again in the news. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things that stand out to me. I, I think one of them is, in fact, this issue of ports of author ports of entry, rather. Um, and and you know, at first blush, I think it might seem like it's getting into the weeds, but but really, it's a pretty simple principle that I think if we could communicate one thing to most Americans, I think this would be clarifying that you have designated places where it's legal to cross back and forth across the border, um, and. That's where most of the action is. And that's where we have customs officers inspecting people as they enter the country. Where we have border patrol agents, and those are the folks in green uniforms we hear so much about, they're patrolling between the ports of entry, right? They're looking for people who are crossing illegally. And if you put, a, put aside sort of the issue, the misdemeanor and the idea of, of crossing the border illegally, if you talk about serious crime, right? Because this is what comes up a lot when we talk about the border, right? Cartels and, and trafficking, trafficking of drugs, trafficking of humans. We associate those things, I think a lot of Americans do, with border patrol, with, 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 with catching people out in the open desert, uh, ramming trucks you know, um, um, through the open desert and crossing the line and chasing them, you know, you know, chasing them for, for miles. That's generally not how crime is interdicted at the border. The vast majority of crime that is interdicted at the border in terms, again, of, of heavy crimes of drug shipments and human trafficking. Those are interdicted at ports of entry. And so I, I think, if anything, we could use that information to try to redefine for ourselves what border security looks like. What is border security, right? What's effective border security? And if we're talking about effective border security, I think we're talking about making ports of entry more robust more um, capable of processing inspections quickly. Uh, that means x-ray technology and other tools that are out there and being developed but not being implemented as much as they could be. So I think that's really something to, to focus on. And also too, just sort of backing up even more on the issue of border security and an opportunity to redefine it. I think we can talk about what does it mean in terms of having the communities around the border feel secure, right? So what does it mean to be secure in your home? What does it mean to be secure in your job? Um, what does it mean to be secure in your environment? You know, one place where I spent a lot of time was the Tijuana River estuary. And the Tijuana River is really complicated. It starts, it's mainly a, a, a seasonal river, right? For to, to handle flooding water during the, 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 the wet season. And it starts south of the border in Tijuana and it snakes north into the US right at the Pacific Ocean. And there's an estuary there and it's beautiful setting but it's some of the most polluted water in the world, uh, mainly because of sewage runoff from Tijuana and, um, and chemicals from all the American companies and their maquiladoras. And so that area is so um, environmentally hazardous to the people of Tijuana and the people of Imperial Beach, California going into the ocean. So I think if we can capture something like that and understand that that's part of border security, getting that estuary cleaned up so that people are not getting sick in the water and getting sick in the, uh, the air that they're breathing. Um, I think that that's uh, an opportunity we're at now, particularly with this administration, uh, to, to reinvent or to redefine how we think about border security. You, you know, that's a really interesting point. I mean, in your book, you delve into this issue of how effective we've been at improving border security, uh, you know, reducing illegal border crossings and so forth. Yet, you know, border security always seems to grab the headlines, no matter how much progress we've made. It seems like, you know, it overshadows everything else and we ignore many of the broader issues that we ought to be addressing. Yeah. And even in the most uh, uh, up to date context, in terms of what we've been talking about for the first half of 2021, with so many uh, uh, unaccompanied minors and families crossing, if you put that in the historic context, let's say going back, you know, we've been keeping stats on this since the 60s. But we really had some crazy crests in terms of numbers in the early 2000s. We're still not even quite approaching that. We need to, I think that 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 big step back is very helpful, that context. I think that if I could talk to fellow journalists about this, it would be, a, you know, about really trying to find that context because some of the, a lot of the headlines we get and a lot of the conversations we get on television are about uh, the notion of surge, the no notion of crisis. And I'm not going to say that it's not a serious issue at the border and it hasn't been. Uh, the last couple of months. But if you look at it in the context of the last 20 years, it's not an outlier or it's not busting records. I think that that's really important to keep track of. 
It's also important to keep track of the nature of the people that are crossing. It's meaningful that it's families. It's meaningful that it's minors. That tells us something about uh, about you know where they're coming from and the circumstances they're coming from. Of uh, uh, you know, we look at uh, apprehensions twenty years ago is a lot more single males coming to the U.S. looking for work. Uh, families, mothers, this really does tell us that there are some legitimate safety uh, and survival issues coming into play as well. And I would even say even over the last you know couple of weeks, we've seen the numbers again go down a bit, indicating the seasonal element, right? We see this every year. We see springtime, weather warms up uh, and uh, people are able to do, uh, and the weather dries out too, and people are able to cross before it gets really hot in the summer. And so Again, that bigger context, I think, is very helpful and to not ever get caught up in just sort of one moment, one week, right, uh, because there's constantly these fluctuations. And again, not to get caught up in the theatrics of the actual border. Well, when it comes to those theatrics, you know, one of the things we often hear, especially from politicians, is that we can't do anything until we fix the border. And again, your your book makes it, you know, very clear that the border is never going to be completely fixed, at least in any sort of finite way. So how do we get past this issue of the border as a stumbling block to effective policy? It's, you know, uh, walls never stop traffic. They only divert it, right? So we build 30-foot walls and stiff winds knock them down. Uh, I, I saw footage from tunnels that were built uh, 90 feet into the earth with elevators um, and, and train tracks. So I think it starts with saying this, that we have to accept the fact that, that some individuals are always gonna find a way around the system. And we know that applies to life, right? Uh, whatever rules are put in place for our second grade classroom or for our small town or for our country, uh, people are gonna break the rules, people are gonna get around them. So we have to understand that and, it, and we have to manage those individuals. But when we're talking about the vast majority of crossings, we, I think it's important to look at root causes, right? Why are people crossing? Why are people crossing into the U.S.? And I've touched on some of these in terms of environmental issues, and we've been talking more about this, which is good. Major hurricanes going through Central America, um, uh, 9 million people displaced by the weather from the last several months and, and violence. So looking at those root causes that are driving people away from their homes to seek safety, but then also, too, the other big component of this, and, I, and I'm excited to talk about this because I really think it can be a, a unifying uh, matter, a unifying issue within the, the, the immigration discussions. There are, in fact, a lot of people coming for work. They're coming for work. And sometimes people are coming for both, right? They're coming for safety and for work. Just because you get safe uh, doesn't mean you don't, you don't also need work. But some people are truly just coming for work. They're coming for a better life, right? Like so many P Americans' parents and grandparents and great-grandparents did. And I think we need to confront the fact that whether or not we like it, we are all operating in a globalized labor market. So globalized, gl gl capitalism has been globalized, right? We have companies that operate internationally. They have headquarters in the U.S., but they operate in five or six or seven different countries. Um, we need to, to acknowledge the fact that workers have been told more or less a lie, right? That, you know, capitalism is about free market, free labor market, go get the best job you can get, and you have a chance to succeed. But in fact, that's not what's really happening. Capitalism has been globalized in a lot of ways, but the labor market has not been fully globalized. And I think that's something we need to reckon with. And I realize it's a big topic and, and, and something that it's going to take time to iron out. But I think we just need to start to even confront that fact. Right. And again, I, I'm not saying this is someone's choice. I think a lot of people, this might upset them. They might say, I don't want to compete in a, in a globalized labor market, but it's where we are. It's where we are. And so I think we need to understand that and embrace that. And, and for me, that means making the best work environment we can in the U.S. And that means for anyone who wakes up in the morning and puts in a hard day of work. Right. We need to protect everyone. We need to understand that if some workers don't have good work, uh, safe working conditions, if some workers are working for substandard uh, uh, wages, this hurts everyone. This suppresses wages. This establishes norms that employers get away with. So let's just even say, what if what if we had much better enforcement of existing labor laws? Right. What if we made sure that we had more inspections for workplace and safe, safety? Right. What if we um, what if we uh, uh, looked at it? At, 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 and this is something I know you know about in the work you've done in sort of the construction industry. What if we looked at employers who are who are routinely going to undocumented workers 
uh, in hiring them, right? I think these are the things to look at because again, my interest is in protecting all workers. And I think that if you, if you allow employers to take advantage of undocumented workers who are gonna give a, a, a fake social security card to get the job, which means they're gonna work hard all day, pay taxes into social security, not reap any benefits from those taxes and monies they put into the social safety net. Uh, that doesn't help anyone uh, in, the, in the long run. And so um, I think if we can sort of rally around the idea of, of, of strengthening our labor laws to protect workers and to confront this globalized labor market, I think that's a good starting point. And I, I, I hear people on the far left and the far right talk about that, right? Bernie Sanders is always talking about protecting workers. I, I've heard uh, nativists talk about uh, protecting workers. So I think it's a starting point. And I think there's some, 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 some potential for consensus there. That's something we've dealt with a lot here at the rational middle as well. I mean, we've kind of created this second tier shadow economy in which workers are afraid to come forward because they're afraid of being deported. It creates almost this subculture that leads to, you know, bad labor practices and abuses. And I think that's something people don't often take into account when they think about immigration. You know, um, these people are not fully participating, the undocumented, I mean, are not fully participating in the economy. I mean, they can't, you know, find finance cars or open bank accounts, if we let them be uh, able to participate in our economy more fully, we'd actually be getting more benefit as opposed to less. Instead, we have this system that just seems like, you know, de facto amnesty. Exactly. I mean, so when those people are invited, brought out of the shadows, invited into the society they're contributing to, um, they, they, they do all these things. They, they generate uh, uh, economic activity, right? And, and yeah, it's very important, the point you just underscored, if, if, if someone is hiring an undocumented worker to pay them non-union wages, what that means is that a union member is not being paid union wages, right? So everyone's getting hurt. So, so it, it benefits everyone to bring these workers out of the shadows. And also too, and this is the really hard part to, to, to reconcile because it deals with sort of the, the macro and the micro, but the, the big picture is there, there's a there's a there's a gap in the labor market. Employers need more workers in some particular fields, right? In terms of construction, and also in terms of agriculture, and that's the you know the farm workers bill. Um, there are areas where uh, employers consistently need more laborers, and there aren't Americans there to do that work. We need to to to, to know that. But I think that what happens on the micro is you do have communities, you do have individuals that um, in their own personal narrative lose out, um, uh, lose a job, uh, uh, an opportunity uh, because of these dynamics and they feel threatened by other workers. But again, I, I think the more we can reckon with the fact that we're just already in this environment where it's already globalized and come to terms with that together, the better off we'll be. But I, I think it is that caveat is that we have to remain sensitive to the people that have in fact um, uh, seen some uh, 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 some troubles in their community and, and some job loss in their community uh, because that does there are sort of those those pressure points where where um, sort of shifting economies and and welcoming uh, more guest workers into the environment does make it harder on on some American workers and I think we need to be sensitive to that as well but the big picture tells us that we need more workers to keep the economy growing and to fill the wage gap. You know, that last point is really important, and it, it really comes out clearly in your book. You tell all these personal stories about the border, and you don't sugarcoat any of it. You don't, you don't hold back on the people who are hurt by border issues. And I think what you come away from with these stories is really the complexity of, of what we're dealing with, not just on the border, but with immigration in general. And I'm wondering, you know, from an economic standpoint, do you think we need to be thinking bigger? Absolutely. I, I fully agree. And, and I, you know, we have a, a, what was it, 2017 or 18 letter signed by 1500 economists uh, uh, from all from the political sphere, the whole rather political spectrum, um, talking about how much uh, Im immigrants help the economy grow. And I, I think that we already have so many fantastic case studies of, of communities, a lot of times small uh, towns in red states uh, that have been completely revitalized by immigrant communities, uh, or rather growth in the immigrant community. So Hazleton, Pennsylvania uh, uh, is a good example. I went to Middletown, New York, which is actually sort of a more of a, a, a traditional Rust Belt, sort of more manufacturing upstate town. 
and uh, major population decline over a few decades, uh, uh, economic decline. But they've seen some growth in recent years on the back of immigrants coming there a lot of times to do seasonal work, uh, a lot of apple orchards in the area, some uh, canning and some manufacturing in the area. Um, and Middletown has seen some growth in terms of housing and, 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 and retail uh, because of uh, those immigrant communities growing. We've also seen this in Ohio, right? Uh, there's a whole program across the state of Ohio that started in Akron, uh, the Welcome Akron uh, program, uh, that really tried to lure uh, guest workers uh, into the community because they were had been shrinking population-wise. And now, uh, for the first time in, in I think, four decades, uh, they're set to see their first growth. Um, so I think we have really good examples out there. And again, not in sort of um, uh, predictable places, big cities or blue states, but uh, uh, all over the country in different kinds of communities. Now, I wanted to ask you about idea space. Uh, we had Rick Taft on our podcast a few weeks ago, and it's just such an interesting endeavor what you guys are doing. So for those who haven't listened to the podcast, tell us a little bit about how, how idea space works and how that dovetails with your book and with the other immigration work that you're doing. Yeah, I'm really excited about idea space. So I'm working with, as you said, Rick Taft, who uh, founded the effort. We're a new 501c4, uh, working alongside Jordan Heller, who is a fantastic uh, editor and writer that I worked with in the past. And what we've done is we've identified uh, what we call players, 30 people that are really big voices on the issue of immigration, uh, again, across the political spectrum. And some of them are uh, office holders, some of them are academics, some of them are activists. They're people that, that, that drive the conversation. And we've identified their key ideas on particular issues. You know, I think it's very easy for us to think about immigration as an issue, but it's important to know that it's more, much more like a bucket with a lot of issues inside of it. So we've pulled those out, right? So when it comes to border security or asylum or detention, all of these factors that are part of the immigration discussion, and we've identified the, those players and their ideas as they pertain to those particular issues. And then we've sort of synthesized those positions looking for points of consensus. So what are areas where this, this vast array of people that seem to have very different ideas, where do they come together? What are the places where we can see even just sort of slivers of starting points for consensus? And, um, and, so, and then we also produce um, regular material to dive deep into some of those issues and some of those places where we see consensus. So about every month we're producing uh, a reported essay, something we're calling a strategic inquiry. Uh, we're doing interviews with some of these players that we've identified and other people in the immigration realm. Uh, we're doing some congressional briefings. We had a fantastic conversation last week with Representative John Curtis of Utah, who's put together a really fascinating proposal for state-based visa programs. I mean, this is a really good example, right? Here's something that has great potential for consensus, um, empowering states to allocate their own visas. So it gives Republicans something they've a fundamental they're always pursuing, right? Empowering states, states' rights. And it gives Democrats something they want, more avenues for immigration, for more ways for people to legally come into the country. And, you know, when you get down, the really crazy thing is, as inflammatory as this topic can be on a federal, on a national level, when you dial down on the municipal level or county level in more rural areas, you talk to mayors, you talk to county uh, county commissioners, this issue becomes so very, very apolitical in a lot of cases because those officials realize the economic imperatives and the, the issues around population in some cases they're having, and they've got to address those issues. And so you see uh, Republican mayors, you see Democratic mayors um, advocating to uh, finding programs, like I, I referenced the, um, the Welcome Akron program, finding ways to uh, bring more immigrants, more uh, guest workers into their communities. And I think that that's one area of consensus that is really sort of underestimated. So we're trying to identify those with idea space. Um, and eventually we'd like to go on and tackle other big issues like climate change and election reform. But I think immigration is going to keep us busy for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to keep us all busy for a while. DW, thanks for joining us today and uh, helping us kick off the summit. And now we'll turn it over to the panel discussions. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you so much uh, to DW and Lauren for getting us started off the right way for the Immigration Solutions Summit. Um, I understand as I'm looking at the attendee list here, more people are joining us. It's so great to see 
the kinds of people that are joining us from all over the country, all over the world, really, as we are beginning to work our way into the panel discussions to start finding some of the solutions that DW and Lauren were just talking about. Um, just to give you guys a little bit about myself, I'm, I'm Chris Lyon. I'm a producer here working at The Rational Middle. Uh, and if you don't know, um, The Rational Middle was founded in 2011 as a media production company uh, that has become known for creating award-winning films about contentious issues on everything from energy and the environment to immigration, of course, uh, and healthcare. We've worked with some amazing organizations and advocates across the globe to engage in a fact-based educational focused um, way with the aim of creating a common base of understanding for complex issues, which we can all gather around uh, to have meaningful discussions. Uh, many of the things, as Lauren mentioned, uh, videos and podcasts are available to watch for free at rationalmiddle.com. Um, and in the early years of the Rational Middle, we were touring um, all over the world, showing our videos, um, and it didn't quite dawn on us until we started getting into having discussions that it was the 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 real time conversations that was really the focus of the change that was happening at our events and since that time the rational middle team has been fostering discussion and broadening understanding by using those documentary films as a place setter um, and then having the live conversations just like these um, and of course, one of the most uh, pressing issues uh, facing immigration today is managing the flows across the southern border of the United States, finding humane ways to direct migrants to ports of entry, uh, facilitating expedient judicial processes, as well as preventing illicit activities that will all combined to help us create a more secure border and a more orderly and fair entry into the United States. With that said, and before our discussion, I would like to screen a 10 minute short film that we made called The Wall, America's Line in the Sand, which will be our place setter uh, for this first panel. And it was made in September of 2018 during the previous administration where they were still you know, building the anti-immigration and isolationist approach to policy. Um, and we look forward to seeing how things have continued to change during our panel. Um, but without any further ado, let's roll the wall, America's line in the sand. We're talking about putting up a fence. In the last six years, two immigration bills have set quotas for legal entries and established provisions for the admission of political refugees and the relatives of earlier immigrants. Now, obeying immigration laws is the new litmus test for public officials. I'm suing to force the federal government to control the border. We will continue to enhance our security at our border. All Americans are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country, and we must do more to stop it. Unfortunately, the United States has not been in complete control of its borders for decades, and therefore illegal immigration has been on the rise. You know, we all agree on the need to better secure the border, we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. The one thing that brings the most attention to the border is going to be the activity associated with illegal immigration into our country from Mexico or through Mexico into the United States. As easy as it would be to say that the idea of a wall is a function of President Trump's focus on it, it's an idea that has been popping around uh, policy making circles for years and years. And it's something that people can see. They feel like they can put their hands around it. The reality is, is that that physical wall, a barrier, already exists in many places. Some of it is triple layered fences with lights and cameras and razor wire at the top and roads in between. It's a sort of a hodgepodge, if you will. In some places, it's no more than a canyon or a river. But the key question is not the wall. The key question is whether the wall will actually solve the problem that Mr. Trump says it should solve. 
We're building the wall in theory to keep out people entering illegally, but if you look at the undocumented population, about 40% are overstays. They come here on a visitor's visa or even students, and they don't want to go home, so they just wind up staying. So potentially half of the immigrants that would come into the United States and stay here without papers would be people that were actually coming in planes and ships and by bus with a visa. Now, what's the wall going to do to drugs? Well, most drugs, 85, 90% of them, come at ports of entry, hidden in vehicles, in trucks, in cars, on, on bodies, in bodies. You know, they're, they're coming right under the noses of CBP agents, and those drugs will continue to come in. But rhetorically, the idea that you can put up a wall to stop what people analogize to water, right? We talk about a flood of immigrants. So what do we build to stop a flood? We build a dam. And the idea of a wall is that. It's a rhetorical device that is simple for a lot of people to understand. The truth is we are not being flooded with people. We have to keep in mind that compared to where we were, we're in a very good place. 1999, 2000 was the peak level of illegal immigration into this country. Over 1.6 million apprehensions that the Border Patrol did. Fast forward to where we are today. Last fiscal year, there was a total of 310,000 apprehensions an over 80% reduction from the peak years to where we are today. What we have done has actually worked very well. Boots on the ground, sensors, agents, fencing where it's required in urban areas and so on. When you add all these different things, it's paid off. We're not looking at a complete collapse of the border. Actually, we're looking at a turnaround of the border. But it is key for many folks to know that we have a secure border. And that doesn't necessarily mean a wall. It may mean parts of a wall or parts of a fence. It may mean better entry exit technology. It may be better interior enforcement so we deal with truly violent criminals who shouldn't be on our streets, who should be in deportation proceedings. There's nothing wrong uh, with uh, spending a reasonable amount of money to the point through a combination of physical barriers and technology that the Border Patrol can represent that they have effective control of 95% of the border. You can never say, no, we want 100%. That's like saying we're going to eliminate 100% of drug usage or crime or anything. Today, the number of Border Patrol agents is 20, 21,000. The budget is so much larger, the vehicles, the technology much more sophisticated, the drones, the deployment, the maintenance, the, the whole apparatus is so much more expensive. There's a point at which the rate of return begins to kind of decrease. You begin to see that catching each immigrant and processing each undocumented immigrant is costing more and more and more and more money. And we haven't stopped to say, wait a minute, how much is enough for every kilogram of cocaine and for every immigrant that we catch. We haven't stopped and asked that question. For now, we're still throwing money at the problem. Border infrastructure, whether it be a wall, border barrier, is good if it is judicious, if it is measured, and it gives the outcome that we're looking for. The outcome that we're looking for overall is prevention of illegal activity on a persistent basis in a given area of operation. When we are successful, that reduces illegal activity on both sides of the border. We should not be building infrastructure, be it walls, barriers, or whatever, for posturing purposes. And so the question is, by building a wall, a physical structure, are we going to keep people from coming in? No, we still need to have a process. And that process is in play every day along 330 ports of entry along the U.S.-Mexico border and at every consular office in the world and at every embassy in the world. I think we as a country, as a society, as an economy, need to continue to have a flow of people coming in here. Should it be orderly? Absolutely. Should we give preference to some? Yes, those who can contribute, absolutely. But American tradition and American values has always been, let's also take care of those who still dream, who still aspire, and who can still contribute. The immigration reform is really essential to achieving border security. 
If I could tell Border Patrol agents that they wouldn't have to spend their time identifying and processing busboys and nannies who were trying to enter the country through the deserts between the ports of entry, but could instead direct those people to the ports of entry where they would have a means of lawfully entering the country to get work, agents could instead focus on people who are coming here for more nefarious reasons. And the lawful flow of people and goods that should and could be directed through the ports would go that way. But that's not the system that we have right now. Right now, we have a system in which people who desire to come to the United States for work, in many cases, don't have a pathway to come here. They don't have a line they can get in. And as a result, you have seen historically people who have gone around the law in order to come to the country. The goal of policy should be to increase the cost of illegal entry and decrease the cost of legal entry. We focused so much energy on increasing the cost of illegal entry and far less effort on decreasing the cost of legal entry. If you make it easy for people to come into the United States, legally live here and work here, that gives them no reason to cross the border or otherwise attempt to evade immigration laws. But our country needs immigration. It needs legal immigration. And a big part of that is reform of our immigration system. How do we define what we want on our borders? Do we want a sealed border? Do we want a managed border? Do we want a secure border? Do we want a governed border? Or is there another adjective to describe what we need? Then identify the metrics that are going to help us say, OK, we have met our objective. Ideologically, I think America knows where it wants to go. It wants to continue to build on what was started in 1776, what was solidified in our Constitution. We need to be taking steps to support that vision of America, the greatest country in the world. America, freedom for all, equality for all. It's not easy. I think one of the things that we're very good as a country is experiencing hard lessons and learning from those hard lessons. Sometimes it just takes a little longer than what most of us would like for it to happen. All right, uh, so that was uh, the America's Line in the Sand, uh, the episode uh, from the first season of the Rational Middle of Immigration series. All of those films, of course, available at rationalmiddle.com. Uh, and something that struck me about watching that film, uh, of course, as well as hearing the keynote discussion uh, earlier today, was the um, that experience at the, of being at the border and looking at these prototypes that were put together by the Trump administration. We actually were able to go down and visit uh, that location uh, for the production of this episode. And what was striking was not just what was on the American side of the border with those prototypes, but what was also on the other side of that border, which was an incredibly impoverished community, a shanty town, really. And um, I'll be fascinated to see how the change with the addition of that port of entry will affect those residents, how it will affect the dynamics of the existing ports of entry. Um, and of course, as the new administration uh, changes the policies around uh, Re everything from refugees, which we hope will happen sometime in May, um, as well as the kind of ongoing um, commerce end of the, the equation there as well. So anecdotes aside, uh, we do have a fantastic panel to help us walk through the challenges and potential solutions for uh, the southern border of the United States. Uh, but before we begin, I do want to let everyone know the format that we're going to be using today. Um, while the panel is in progress, we invite all of our attendees to submit questions through Zoom's Q&A function. Uh, we will not be using the hand raise uh, feature, uh, bringing people up on stage this, uh, for this event. And once all of the questions have been submitted, I will come back when the panel is finished with their discussion. And I will be asking those questions to the panel as well as to Ali Narani, who is going to be our moderator. Um, I do want to uh, let you guys know who's going to be a part of the panel. They'll have a chance to introduce themselves a little bit more. 
um, in a, a moment, but we have with us uh, Randy Caps, who's the Director of Research for U.S. Programs at the Migration Policy Institute. We also have Victoria DeFrancesco Soto, who is Assistant Dean for Civic Engagement and Lecturer at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. And we also have uh, Tony Payan, who is the director of the Center for the United States and Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. He was actually featured in uh, the video that we just watched as well. So we have an exciting panel there and I do, we are, let's see, we are waiting here for one more person to join us, but I do wanna tell you a little bit about our moderator, uh, his Ali Narani, he is the uh, President and Chief Executive Officer for the National Immigration Forum, a nonpartisan advocacy organization working with faith, law enforcement, uh, and business leaders to promote the value of immigrants and immigration. He grew up in California as the son of Pakistani immigrants, and Ali there learned how to forge alliances among people from a wide range of backgrounds, a skill that has served him extraordinarily well uh, as uh, one of the nation's most innovative coalition builders, something that we are truly um, want to be a part of and love the partnership that we have there with the National Immigration Forum. And uh, here is Ali Narani now. So I will uh, allow him to come up on the stage and we will have him lead our discussion and uh, further introduce our panelists. Ali Narani, thank you so much for being able to join us today. Hey, thank you so much. How's everybody doing? Good, I hope. Good. <laughs> Sorry for uh, kind of zooming in here, kind of a, a little bit on the warm side. Um, this is a really, really important panel in terms of, uh, um, you know, the, the, what's happening on the border, what's happening in Washington, D.C., and really um, how do we understand the issues, but then also shape a policy conversation, much less a political conversation moving forward. So let me do, you know, some really quick introductions of just a, an all-star panel of folks that I've had the opportunity to, to talk with in the past and I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Randy Caps is Director of Research for U.S. Programs at the Migration Policy Institute. Um, if you haven't visited their website, um, do so every single day. I will admit that I do that every morning. It's like MPI, Twitter, uh, New York Times. So uh, I'm sure everybody MPI is worried about whether or not, you know, that's uh, a normal thing to do. But uh, Migration Policy Institute and all the work that Randy does over there is incredibly uh, important. Um, he's done profiles of immigrant populations across the country, Arkansas, Connecticut, uh, Kansas City, Washington, D.C., et cetera. Uh, Victoria De Francesco Soto is Assistant Dean for Civic Engagement and a lecturer at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at UT Austin, go Longhorns, um, where she was selected as one of UT's game changers. Uh, um, Vicky is uh, also, she's received her PhD in political science from Duke University, uh, during which time she was a National Science Foundation Fellow. I actually just spoke at her class a couple of weeks ago, so this is my opportunity to kind of spin it back around um, and put some tough questions your way. And then our, our third panelist is Tony Payan. He is the Francois and Edward de Gerian, uh, Jeregian Fellow for Mexico Studies and Director of the Center for the United States and Mexico for the United States and Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. He's also a professor of social sciences at the Universidad Autonoma uh, Ciudad Juarez uh, um, uh, and has really done an incredible amount of work on not just border issues, but cross-border issues. Um, and he is the author of two books, one of which is Cops, Soldiers and Diplomats, and the other is The Three U.S.-Mexico Border Wars, Drug, Drugs, Immigration, and Homeland Security. Security. So again, thank you so much for, for joining uh, today and, and for the opportunity and a big thank you to the folks at Rational Middle. So let's start with kind of the news of the day. Um, yesterday we saw, uh, um, uh, late yesterday I should say, uh, CBP released numbers uh, for border apprehensions over the month of April. So let's kind of start there big picture. And Randy, if I could turn to you to get your sense of, okay, what are we seeing at the border 
Uh, and then the questions for the other panelists are, what does this mean for kind of the situation? But what does it mean uh, uh, in terms of issues that we need to be thinking about at the border moving forward? Randy. Thanks, Ali, and thanks Rational Middle and everyone for joining today. Um, so the numbers just released yesterday, about 178,000 what are called encounters. And that includes mostly people apprehended by the Border Patrol, as well as those who were not let in at the ports of entry, um, mostly across the land border with Mexico. And um, these are high numbers, both um, March and April, we saw around 175,000, highest monthly levels we've probably seen in nearly 20 years. Um, it's a combination of predominantly two groups of people. So if you went back 20 years ago, most of the people the Border Patrol apprehended were adults, mostly men, and almost entirely from Mexico. It was largely a, a labor flow of people looking for better uh, economic opportunities in the United States, largely adults. Um, those numbers started to go down pretty rapidly after the big recession in 2008 to 9. And for most years since then, we've seen the numbers of Mexican immigrants trying to cross the border go down and actually a substantial drop in the total number of Mexican unauthorized immigrants in the U.S. Um, starting about seven or eight years ago in 2013 to 14 is when we started to see this new group of uh, Central Americans, predominantly uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, Hondurans uh, coming across. Many of them are women and children. So it's a much more diverse flow in terms of the, the family structure. Um, they sometimes arrive as families traveling together, a parent and a child. Uh, sometimes it's a child or an adolescent arriving alone, what the federal government calls unaccompanied children. And since 2013, 14, those are the numbers we've seen increase the most in many years. A majority have been families or unaccompanied children from Central America. Um, and then we've seen sort of ups and downs. Uh, there were a couple of years during the Trump administration, their first year, 2017, and then um, their, their last year before the pandemic, 2019, uh, when the numbers were very, very low. Part of that was due to the, the, I think, the shock of Trump's election and the policies that he ran on and then the policies that his administration implemented that came into full force during 2019 and 2020. Um, what we have now is, is interesting because it's actually a bit of both. Historically, we had a lot of adults coming in from Mexico um, that were caught at the border. Uh, and then more recently, we've had Central American families and children in large numbers. And these latest numbers show both of those flows. And that has some interesting implications. On the child and family side, it's how to protect the children. It's how to ensure people seeking um, asylum can um, be able to uh, have that access in the United States without encouraging large numbers of people to come. That's always been the trade-off. But we also have, you know, more than half of the, these apprehensions are adults, and most of those are from Mexico again. And so that's kind of a resurgence of what we saw in the past. Um, I think I'll stop there because that's my sort of tour of the numbers, and then we can discuss what it means to have um, this now very diverse flow. I should say one other thing, though. Also, something that's actually very new within the last two to three years is people coming from other regions of the world, not just Mexico and Central America, Haiti, Cuba, and increasingly still small numbers, but increasing numbers coming from Africa and Asia. Uh, those other country uh, apprehensions were up to about 20% of the total in April, um, which is much higher than we've seen uh, in, in years in the past. So uh, Vicky, let me turn it over to you. What's your, your take on the numbers? What is a, you know, what do you think uh, that means in terms of the Biden administration being successful? What's the work that they still have ahead of them? You're on mute still. I still can't get past the getting off mute. Uh, but before I, I, I get started, I wanted to thank Rational Middle for having this space, right? Immigration has become such a charged issue and it's important to have these spaces where we can come together and discuss. And also I wanted to second you, Ali, MPI is in my morning rotation as well, along with Twitter, Washington Post, uh, Breitbart too is part of my rotation. So let me underscore one thing that Randy said before I get to the public opinion lens. I think as a political scientist, this is the lens that I'm always bringing to the news, to the data, to the numbers that we're seeing. But it's, it's 
it's new and it's old what we're seeing, right? So just this past month, we saw uh, a lot of numbers in terms of single adult males crossing over, which is something reminiscent of what we'd seen, you know, two decades past, but there's this newness of the family unit. So what this means in terms of policy is really trying to figure out new problems new issues, how do we manage this, and also resolving issues that we never really did a good job of resolving 10, 20 years ago. So I think that is what is ahead of us in terms of policy. But in terms of public opinion, I, I, I wanna put some numbers before y'all. Uh, this past month, earlier this month, the University of Texas and Texas Tribune put out some poll numbers. So every couple of months, uh, UT and Texas Tribune does um, you know polling about what are the most important issues for folks here in Texas, approval ratings of Joe Biden, of, of, of different state leaders. And what grabbed me was the fact that we saw the Texans score immigration as important an issue as COVID, right? So they are both consuming the minds of Texans. And, and this is relatively new because in the last couple of polls, we had not seen that it was COVID, COVID, COVID as one would expect. And so while here in Texas, we like to think that, you know, what is important in Texas or what is in, on the mind of Texans is on the mind of everyone else. I know that's not the case, but I think it is a harbinger of what is to come. And I, and I went and I was looking at, at Gallup and even though the economy and, and COVID is still really at the top, you see immigration at about 14% in the last month or two. And when we think about, you know, look at the number of mass shootings that we have had, you know, look at issues regarding healthcare, you know, healthcare coverage has been one of these about voting rights, social justice, and immigration is right up there below the economy and below COVID, it makes you think, that the sheer magnitude of these numbers that we're just talking about, right, the, the record highs of, of, of 20 years, is really getting to the point where it's, it's, it's consuming public thinking in terms of what matters to us as we move forward from COVID. You know, God willing, there is that light at the end of the tunnel, folks are getting vaccinated, and now the border, which has always been a hot issue, is going to command more attention. So from the political landscape, I think it is important for us to keep in mind that it has really positioned itself as a major issue of attention in general, not just for those of us here, right? We're, 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 you're speaking to the, preaching to the choir rather here. We care about immigration, we think about it a lot, but now you see a whole lot more people thinking about immigration. So I think that this is only going to ramp up, especially, as we get into 2022 and we get into election cycles. And we know that immigration is one of those issues that always gets into the limelight when we get into an election cycle. Yes, indeed. And elections seem to happen, you know, every three months, as far as I can tell in the immigration space. Um, Tony, from your perspective, you know, what I was wondering if we could kind of broaden the, or expand, open the aperture a little bit here. And, Yes, speak, would love your, your take on what do these numbers mean for the Biden administration, but if you could give us a sense of kind of what you are seeing um, of how these pressures are playing out on the Mexico side of the border. Um, and because, you know, it's a border between co two countries. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening uh, uh, in Mexico as well. Sure, uh, well, let me, uh, let me thank you all for, uh, for the invitation to participate in this panel. It's a pleasure to be here as always. Uh, and uh, that's a really very, uh, a really good question. Uh, I am currently in El Paso, uh, just visiting El Paso and Juarez, uh, trying to understand what is going on. And I can tell you that uh, uh, in visiting Juarez, all the Cubans that were in the MPP uh, program uh, the Migration Protection Protocol program are now gone from Ciudad Juarez. They were let into the United States now. And um, I think uh, uh, President Lopez Obrador at some point, I think, found it very convenient uh, to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, he searched and found a modus vivendi with uh, President Trump uh, saying, oh, look, the president is going to give us an opportunity uh, uh, as long as we do what he wants on immigration and stem the tide from Central America and deploy the National Guard and the military uh, throughout Mexico and expel 
uh, quite a few of these uh, immigrants, which Mexico did, by the way, in the tens of thousands as well, not just the U.S., uh, and detained, uh, you know, tens of thousands of them. Many of them have been detained for a very long time in these uh, detention centers in Mexico as well. But I think Mr. Lopez Obrador saw a political opportunity to do what President, Lop what President Trump wanted, to, uh, wanted him to do on immigration and then get away with uh, a series of other things like uh, threatening uh, Mexican democratic institutions, uh, managing, attacking his political enemies, uh, you know, playing kind of a Trump card with the media and the opposition and the institutions and just messing around. And of course, uh, some violations of the USMCA, NAFTA and then USMCA. Uh, and so, uh, but, I, but I think that, you know, with Biden, I think uh, President Lopez Obrador doesn't get along very well. We saw that uh, uh, the vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, put the, uh, this card on the table, but also security and a number of other issues that are of concern to the United States. And I, I find that it's going to be very difficult for these two countries to cooperate anytime soon on these issues. Obviously, Mr. Biden has been distracted by a number of issues. Immigration is just one of them. There's a number of issues that... that uh, that are on his plate. Uh, and uh, uh, Kamala Harris is now trying to negotiate between Mexico and of course, a very difficult situation in Central America because Bukele is now picking a fight with Washington. And of course, uh, uh, Orlando Fernandez in, in, uh, in Honduras is being accused of drug trafficking. And of course, a difficult situation in Guatemala and a, a, a president in Mexico that fundamentally, I think, dislikes the Biden presidency. Uh, because he feels that he's not going to be able to get away with as much. So will he be able to cooperate? We're not sure. But one thing is certain, uh, in the numbers in the last few months, and I haven't yet parsed through the details of the April numbers, but the March, the February-March numbers show clearly that well over 40% are now Mexicans. This reverses a trend which means that situation in Mexico is deteriorating very, very quickly. And if the United States doesn't really pay attention to Mexico and figures out a way to cooperate with Mexico and to figure out how to get Mr. Lopez Obrador to do the right thing on security, on the economy, on trade, and on and on, and also on immigration, then what we're gonna see is many, many more Mexicans coming up to the border. And I think that's already the case this year. I just want to say one more thing, uh, uh, you know, as we continue our conversation, I'll say more things. Uh, let me tell you, I think that in regards to the United States, this is a political problem. It's not a policy problem any longer. I think that those of us who look at immigration understand just about everything about immigration. We understand the demography of the United States and how that's changing. We understand the economic benefits of immigration. We understand the diversity benefits of immigration. We understand that that's good for the United States. We understand uh, the, the value of an open immigration system and so on. But if you look at Texas, for example, uh, uh, you know, which I look at very closely, you see that the governor Greg Abbott is almost like someone who wants to eat his cake and have it too. He wants to have an open border for trade and energy and he cannot enjoy the economic benefits. And then of course, he in 2015 and 2017, he throws $800 million at the border uh, for border security, for DPS. And of course he was a, a Trumpist in many ways uh, towards the border. So he doesn't wanna regulate the open border and manage the open border. He wants the benefits of, a, of an open border for the benefit of Texas economy and, and companies, but it doesn't want the immigrants. And I think that there is a lot of, there are a lot of contradictions in there and it's highly political. And I think it, in, on immigration, it's the same thing that we're seeing throughout the United States on infrastructure, on COVID. It's everything is so polarized and so politicized. So I think this is no longer a policy problem. It's a political issue. And we need to tackle it as a political issue because the, yep. the, the practical policy solutions, I think we now do fully understand. Them. Thank you, Tony. One thing, and I apologize, my, my you know, it's the life of Zoom, right? So my, my headphones gave out there, so I had to flip over. So I might've missed it if you said it, but Randy, um, I feel like one thing we didn't talk about in the terms of the context setting here is Title 42. Um, if you could kind of give a sense of where we are with Title 42, but then, you know, I think it was the, the Post article that said it was 40% of those numbers were attributed to recidivism as related to Title 42. So I wonder if you kind of bring that into the conversation. 
Sure. Yeah. Title 42 is actually a statute in U.S. law that goes back to 1944 that allows the federal government to basically close the borders due to public health reasons. So early in the pandemic, the Trump, like a year ago, the Trump administration invoked Title 42 as a way to immediately expel anyone caught by the Border Patrol, and that would include families and children as well as adults. Um, you know, the rationale for that was obvious because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the way it works in operation is that the Border Patrol, which usually would take in people, process them for deportation and ask them if they have an asylum claim, and then work with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services to get kind of a, a preliminary look at whether they might have a valid claim. Under Title 42, they simply expel people with minimal to no paperwork, very little time in U.S. custody, and, and basically no opportunity to apply for asylum. So most of the apprehensions starting last spring resulted in uh, Title 42 expulsions. Um, and now, in April, that's still true for the adults um, that are coming on their own. The vast majority of them, almost all, are being expelled under 42, as are more than two-thirds of the families. Um, what happened just before Biden took office, there was a federal court case that said it was illegal to expel uh, the children traveling alone due to their vulnerability. Um, there were some appeals around that, but but essentially when Biden took office, they said that they would stop expelling children. So that's part of the reason why you've had uh, more children traveling alone arrested at the border than ever before, because they can get across. Um, the families are getting across in some places and not others. Uh, there doesn't appear to be a coherent U.S. policy, and, and some of this is related to, to the Mexican government's policy about whether or not they'll accept back the families. Uh, but it's around um, um, it's still 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 a large share of the families that are getting expelled. The other thing I would say about that is that over the years, so so if you went back 20 years ago during the last peak in Mexican um, migration and, and with large numbers of adults coming across, they were basically expelled before too. Uh, they used to call it voluntary return, but it was the same thing in practice. The Border Patrol would find someone and they turn around and take them back to the nearest um, port of entry in Mexico as quickly as they could with minimal uh, paperwork and minimal time in U.S. custody. And starting about 20 years ago, the Border Patrol actually started to hold people longer and even sometimes uh, prosecute them and put them into federal prison for a period of time if they were caught entering several times, for instance. This is the recidivism, Ali, that you mentioned. You know, some people try over and over and over again. They call them recidivists. They get caught more than once. Um, the latest figures that we have now is that that recidivism is up to, you know, maybe as much as 40% of the total and probably higher than that for the adults. And what happens is when you go with the Title 42 expulsions for adults, an unintended consequence is you're sending people back really quickly to Mexico, giving them the opportunity to turn right back around again and try and come in. And when that happens, you have this cycle of multiple apprehensions, people trying over and over again, more of them will get through. So the apprehension rate will go down and, and we don't have good recent data on that, but, but my understanding is the apprehension rate for adults is probably going down and people take more dangerous routes and you have more deaths than deserts and rivers, et cetera, crossing. So that's the unintended consequences of Title 42. Lifting Title 42 on the other hand and saying, okay, now adults and families also will be accepted into the US fully processed, able to claim asylum, just like the children are right now, has the other unintended consequence that it sends a signal that the border is open again, most likely inviting even larger numbers of people to try to, to, to cross. I mean, and, and part of this is also that when somebody gets to the Mexico side of the border, they're paying a smuggler for you know, three tries uh, with that investment, with that, that payment. Right, so you know the, the folks that are making money off of this are are the, the smuggling operations. So um, we are gathered here to speak and kind of think about how do we make the case to the rational middle around smart border policy. So Vicky, I wanted to turn to you um, and kind of based on your research, what you see in other places, um, you know what what you see kind of in the news. What is the 
rational message for a rational border policy. Right. And, and Ali, I think we, we may have even talked about this a couple of weeks ago when, when you visited my class. And, you know, I, I was one of the folks who believed in comprehensive immigration reform, that just all of the pieces fit together, right? If you're going to fiddle over here, you want to tweak over there. But over the last couple of years, I have become more and more convinced that there's not the political appetite for that. So when we're talking to how do you get folks on board to find a solution to immigration, I think it needs to be in smaller steps um, because it has become so charged. You know, essentially, since uh, Donald Trump announced his candidacy in June of 2015, immigration really took on a new level of hyperpartisanship, and it has continued, I would argue, to this day. So in this climate, it's taking on the smaller things and going for the low hanging fruit, going for the small ones, which even though they're small, are still going to be tremendously difficult. You know, the, the poster child of, you know, let's put this at the front of the line is, is DACA recipients and creating a dreamer type of bill. You know, there is that, for example, there are temporary work permits, you know, fulfilling the demand, right? Immigration at its core is about supply and demand, and there continues to be a large demand in the United States for labor and especially specific types of labor. So I think that as we're looking to the short to medium term, and those of us who are stakeholders, who are working with organizations or just as individual citizens that you're talking to your legislator, to your senator, you're sending in those emails, you're making those phone calls is let's start with these pieces, you know, DACA and temporary work permits, or for example, just recently, you know, the desire to see the refugee admissions raised again, because it's not going to happen in one beautiful package that we can tie up with a bow, not now maybe in the future, maybe I'll be proven wrong. I would love nothing more, but it's going to have to be piecemeal, Ollie. And then so how do those, how do we help people understand that those solutions are related to border security? Well, they are. The problem I see right now, because even though I just said that they were low hanging fruit because of the hyperpartisanship when a lot of the very conservative wing of the Republican Party looks at the numbers, they say, we're not going to budge on anything until we, quote unquote, secure the border, whatever that means. But for me, this is part of a larger package of having a functioning immigration system and having a functioning immigration system for me. And I would argue, you know, for, for folks to, to view it in this way is not having folks living in the shadows not forcing folks to break the law because you need these folks in your in your labor pool but you're not going to bring them out of the shadows this is a problem and at the same time you can't have these human rights violations these folks trying to cross the border dangerously then we get you know to the point of the cartels and the in the human trafficking so it's about how do we create legality how do we create a system that honors human rights that honors civil rights and that also fulfills economic needs of this country as well as, as other countries, in particular those in Latin America. So Ali, if I could add, I just, I think in sort of to oversimplify, people are crossing the border for two primary reasons, you know, economic because they want a better life, job opportunity in the US and, and they're fleeing some kind of violence or persecution or fear of that. And so there's a humanitarian side to it and there is an economic side to it. And, you know, it's hard to differentiate those two. There's a lot of mixed reasons in there. But basically what we need is a functioning humanitarian admission system to get people in an orderly fashion, primarily from Central America, but other world regions, you know, to the U.S. And we need a functioning economic immigration system to match people. Uh, with jobs in the U.S. And, and we just don't have either of those right now. Um, there's no low skilled pathway for large numbers of low skilled workers from Central America to the United States. We've let in large numbers of seasonal agricultural workers from Mexico and they're, they're working. The Biden administration is working on trying to expand that to Guatemala. Um, but there would need to be some kind of a pathway for lower skilled economic migrants 
to reduce the demand. And on the humanitarian side, the, the Trump administration um, almost destroyed the U.S. refugee resettlement program. And, and, and it's been very hard. One of the big controversies in the Biden administration is how to restart it and what should those numbers be. We started with a, a screening program, the Central American Miners Program for children who, who were fleeing to try to, to process them um, for refugee admission ahead of time from the region. But that barely got off the ground during the Obama administration. There's no real refugee program. And then when people arrive at the border and claim asylum, um, there's really no functioning asylum system. Um, the way it operates right now is people who, who get apprehended at the border and claim asylum, they basically get a notice. They call it notice to appear. It means that tells them they got to go into the immigration court system to, to you know, show their asylum claim. That court system has 1.3 million cases in a backlog of several years. And there's a report the Department of Homeland Security did uh, just released that shows that those families and children who were apprehended and claimed asylum in 2014, that the vast majority of them either hadn't had their claim resolved yet, or they didn't keep in touch with the immigration courts and they just disappeared in the unauthorized immigrant population. So it's not a very well functioning asylum system. You need to reform that, need to, to improve the refugee admission system and come up with economic pathways for low skilled migrants from the region. Those are the kinds of solutions that need to be part of a, you know, an act of Congress. They need to be part of a bigger deal around immigration. Um, and as soon as you start saying you're gonna admit more low-skilled labor migrants, then the other pieces of the puzzle come in. What about high-skilled migrants? What about people with family ties? That just implicates the whole system. And Tony, from your perspective, what, what's your take on this question of, okay, what is the, the, what's the rational policy solution here? And then we can start to kind of zero in on, on specific components. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to get the Republicans to sign onto almost anything, even DACA. So I, I would recommend that the president, I mean, we, we saw what the executive can do from its own uh, uh, desk. I mean, somebody like Stephen Miller and Randy was just referring to how he single-handedly with practically no legislative action destroyed uh, portions of the immigration system. The, the, the lesson of the Biden administration should be the opposite. Uh, well, if Congress is not going to act, if the Republicans aren't going to give, a, give me any, any of the, uh, uh, you know, the kind of legislation that I need, uh, then I need a really smart group of people to tell me what I can do from the executive and push the boundaries of the executive, push whatever he can. The other thing that I can, that, 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 I, that I think uh, uh, should be the, an option, an important option is to really uh, get on the, on the road and uh, let the American people know that the real problem at the border is really uh, uh, drugs. I mean, look, we, uh, you know, we may be apprehending 170,000 people on the border, encounters is the new term, but there's 90,000 people dying from overdoses all over the country every single year. That's a very serious problem. And you have to work with Mexico on that and you have to convince the American people. But even then, I don't think that a, a favorable public opinion can translate into a political or even a legislative resolution because most Americans already favor immigration. I mean, polls show 60, 65, even 70% saying immigration is good for the country, DACA is good, let those guys in, put them on the path to citizenship. And even then Congress has failed to act. So at this point, I think Mr. Biden has to look at all the options that he's got and push the envelope from the White House. So you brought up something I think that's really important and not a big enough part of this conversation. And I kind of alluded to it earlier, but the role of organized crime at the border. Um, and you know, the way I've been putting it is that um, you know, we as a nation have outsourced our immigration system to the cartels. And you know, somebody who you know, runs a tax, uh, who has a taxi in Honduras has to pay a gang just to run that small business. If they can't pay the gang, the gang is going to kill them or their family. So they pay another organized crime operation to get out of Honduras and they get to the U.S.-Mexico border and they pay another one to, you know, finally be able to present to the U.S. to ask for protection. So you're paying a gang to pay a gang to pay a gang. Um, so I guess my first question in this is, you know, do we think that the, the American public understands the role of organized crime in terms of really facilitating the movement of people in, uh, uh, in an unauthorized fashion? 
And that's then what really, are the solutions that the administration needs to be moving forward on or Congress? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Look, I recently, well, not recently, about the summer before last, last year, nobody traveled and we're all stuck. The summer of late summer of 2019, I was in Springfield, Maryland, uh, talking to some people in the Salvadoran community. And I can tell you that uh, somebody said, hey, meet my cousin and I am uh, nice to meet you. And I said, how long have you been in the United States? And he said, well, I just came in, you know, two, three months ago. And I said, so how much was it? $12,000, $12,000. They guarantee that they'll get you from San Miguel, El Salvador to Springfield, Maryland, but that's $12,000 that are spread throughout. And I think the American people do not know uh, that we have a long historical experience all the way back to the 1920s with alcohol and then marijuana and then other drugs that prohibitionism and supply side economics and trying to stem the flow is the wrong approach to policy. And I think it's already been clear in what Randy and Vicky said, which is essentially, hey, let's depressurize the system. Because I think that the more money we throw at the border, whether it's boots on the ground, technology, budgets, walls, and so on, the, the higher the premiums for criminals to provide that service, that service is not, that need is not gonna go away. And obviously uh, the, 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 the greater the incentives for new entrants to provide those illegal services. And so that only strengthens organized crime. And I think that has to be the major argument that the president makes before the American people, and perhaps, just perhaps, there may be some coincidence with what the Republicans are thinking because they enjoy those kinds of issues, crime and, and the bad guys coming in. Well, what, and so do you, on. what do you what do you think, Vicky? Agree, disagree. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wear my political psychologist hat here and, and, and really focus on the fact that our political brains work on emotion and affect. I mean, you know, the, the hard thinking and the cognition comes in sometimes, but regrettably, we have been conditioned over so many decades to equate um, immigration, drugs, and illegality all in one clump. And so that is going to be very difficult to, to pull apart. Just this morning, because I'm Breitbart, like I said, I, I read both sides of the aisle every morning. And, you know, one of the main captions there was about one of these undocumented immigrants who, who murdered a young woman. And, you know, and that is constantly on the media on the right side of the aisle. So I think that there are a couple of things that need to be done. The first is starting to disentangle the illegality piece and highlighting that there is kind of this drug piece the trafficking piece, and then there's a humanitarian immigration, the economic immigration, That's that has to be done, but it is going to be an uphill battle. I also believe that there needs to be a proactive campaign of humanizing immigrants because we've just seen them as the other, the bad hombres, the bad people are illegal in and of itself, right, the word. So, you know, I always think about the campaign for uh, marriage equality in the gay community and the LGBTQ community, where there was a very concerted effort at saying, let's show that these folks are just like anyone else. They, they love, they have families, they work hard. So I think that there needs to be a, a two-pronged approach in confronting this. And, you know, we're, we're behind on this. Uh, you know, one thing that I thought President Donald Trump was very effective at in, in terms of messaging was how he linked the issue of opioid abuse and opioid overdose, which has really ravaged our community and especially a lot of these white lower SES communities with immigration. So it wasn't just immigration is bad, the bad hombres, and it wasn't just oh, opioid overdoses, it was the interlocking of the two. So we need to put a lot of work into disentangling the two to go forward, Ali. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. He would literally kind of talk about immigration, then talk about opioids, then talk about immigration, and then there would be a build the wall chance. It was um, uh, really, really um, scary effective. Randy, what, what's, your, what's your take on this? 
Well, I mean, I think on a most basic level, um, the, you know, the reason why people focus on the border is it's very visible. It is the border. It's a long, one of the lo longest land borders in the world. People want it to feel it's under control. If it's not under control, it's not. It's drugs. It's it's potential criminals coming across. It's potential terrorists. These are these are the bogeymen of the right, right? I mean, this is this is what keeps coming up time and time again. So it, it's it's appearance as much as it is reality. But there is a reality behind it. I mean, the border is not truly under control if ever increasing numbers of people are coming on the promise of getting to stay in the US through a kind of a quasi legal system, right? I mean, ideally we'd have a system that was fully functioning where some people would get asylum and some people would not. There might be other ways for the people who didn't get asylum to, to come to the United States, but those whose claims were rejected would actually get returned to their home countries. That would go a long way towards sending a signal we have a fair system. It's a balanced system. You know, we abide by our international obligations and we take humanitarian claims seriously, but we're not just going to let anyone come in and we're not going to do it sort of randomly either. Like, you know, right now it's kind of random. A family goes to one part of the border and they can get in another part. They're going to be expelled. And then sometimes the border patrol will move them to another place where they can expel them. That kind of randomness doesn't suit anybody's interests. It doesn't help to the families that are trying to seek asylum and it, it makes it look like the border is less under control. And I, you know, right now th things have leveled off. The numbers of children and families are down slightly from what they were last month. And we're not keeping kids in bad border patrol facilities, you know, which are not designed for them for long periods. It's down to about a day on average that a kid stays in that setting before they go into a better setting uh, under Office of Refugee Resettlement, which they should by law. And the families are not being detained for long periods either. It's just a few days before uh, if, if they're taken into detention at all. So, so we're kind of improving that. So a lot of it has to do with the look and feel of what's going on at the border. And um, both from a humanitarian and from a control perspective. And, and, and there's a lot of things, you know, that the Biden administration can do to try to improve that. They have done that, but they haven't addressed the larger systemic issues with asylum. So before, and I just want to remind folks to, if you have questions, please drop it into the, the Q&A box thing. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Chris in a hot second to... Uh, moderate the Q&A, but I guess my last question for the panelists while I have the Zoom, uh, control of Zoom, if you will, it's like that's all I have left in life is just controlling Zoom. Um, if there were two metrics that you think Congress and the administration should focus on when it comes to control and management of the border, what are those two metrics? Or, Vicky, you want to go first? So I've, I've been thinking a lot about um, the court system, right? The, I, Randy, I think just the number of, of the backlog, it's, it's astronomical. So I think that in order to have a well-functioning asylum system, we need to hear out the asylum cases. They need to be processed and they need to be processed expeditiously. So on, on that account, it's kind of very much of a bureaucratic piece, but I think um, looking at you know, a backlog and making sure that it is a very small backlog. And that's going to entail hiring more judges and, and potentially technology and translators. But I think that this is going to be important as well. You know, I, I also, I, I think the easy one is saying apprehensions at the border, but I think I want to move to looking more at what we were just talking about is the days that unaccompanied minors are at our border patrol facilities. I think that this is just egregious hard stop. And we need to be prepared for surges. You know, hopefully we can get policy implemented so where we will, you know, not have these surges, but if we do have them, we do need to be prepared for worst case scenario or for a surge because there is no excuse. We are, you know, the, the beacon of hope and democracy. And to have these conditions is something that we point our fingers at, at other countries that do that. And that's something that we should not be having here in the United States. Awesome, thank you. Tony, your two metrics uh, for border for border management, real quick. Then yes, uh, very quickly. Look, more, more than the actual metrics, I think before we establish the metrics, we need to establish a definition of what it means to be in control of the border. 
I think there never, I've never seen a very smart discussion of what does it mean to be in control of the border. And then once you do that, once you establish, a, uh, uh, you know, it means 90% operational control, it means 90% uh, of our security, it means whatever that means, and then what are the metrics after that. So, and then of course, the other measure is what is an acceptable risk? It's never going to be zero. The border is never going to be absolutely controlled. Look, there's tunnels, 120 tunnels since 2000, I think the year 2000, 1999 or so. And there is, of course, now uh, the use of drones to smuggle drugs. And so there is always going to be that. So I think the U.S. government needs to rationalize what is acceptable and what is not acceptable and then define it in terms of numbers. Randy, closing word. Yeah, I would just say how quickly people are able to get their asylum claims adjudicated is really important, that that's not an overwhelmed system. And then actually sort of have three on the other end of it, which is the combination of the apprehension rate, which would be obviously as high as possible. So people aren't getting passed. Recidivism rate should be as low as possible. People aren't allowed to try multiple times and deaths on the border should be minimized. Thank you. Let me, let's bring up uh, uh, Chris Lyon from the Rational Middle to run the Q&A. But I just want to say thank you to, to Vicky, Randy, and Tony for a great conversation. Yeah, and thank you guys for um, for all the uh, enlightening conversation and uh, points that you've made. And Ali, thank you for hosting. I know that uh, there are uh, a number of challenges that will be really difficult to solve uh, in a one-hour panel discussion. Uh, but I do want to take some of these uh, questions. There are some themes that kind of run through, so I may not ask exactly what's in here, but uh, trying to kind of cover as many we as we can in a short time. Um, and two of the questions had to do with um, understanding the backlog and the funding of, um, of judges uh, and the court systems to clear that backlog. What is the, what is the holdup uh, in getting the uh, judicial system for adjudicating asylum cases uh, moving more quickly? And this is open to anybody, I suppose. There are some that are, um, that are specific to panelists, but I'll open it to anyone that wants to jump in. Yeah, I can start and others may have more to add to this. I mean, you know, getting through asylum cases, it's, it's a combination of how long it's been on each case, times how many judges and support staff there are to do it. And, you know, there, there just haven't been enough judges to, to handle the caseload. And the process is pretty cumbersome. And one of the things that we've highlighted is that there's this initial initial claim that they take a look at credible fear. D does the person have a credible claim to asylum? And a U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services officer does that. Then it goes into immigration court if they're caught at the border um, for a judge to, to review that and then go forward with the asylum case. And, and then there's, there's an initial hearing where they look at, at, at scheduling the final hearing. There are multiple steps along the way. It's a very complex process. So it takes a, it takes a long time. It's in an adversarial setting because it's an, in court and that could slow things down as well. Um, so uh, it's, it's not just resources, it's the process itself, which is, is pretty cumbersome. I think, I think the only thing I would add to that is, look, there's 460 immigration judges or so in 1.3, almost just under 1.3 million cases. So I think the numbers matter. If you double that number, if you do go to the 1,000 or 1,200, I mean, think about it. In any one day, there's a number of them that are out, sick, on vacation. They can only work eight hours a day. And so on. So how many hours are actually dedicated to, dedicated to resolving the, the number of cases. So the numbers are one thing. And the other one is give the immigration judges much greater discretion to decide the cases. And that refers to the actual process and adjudicate it very quickly if they see no problems with that case instead of subjecting it to an ongoing process. And let ICE know, the, law, the government lawyers, which generally say no, uh, hey, you know, if the, guy, if, if the case is not problematic, the state ought to say we have no, no case and we leave it up to the judge and move it on. Anyone else want to add there? If not, uh, there is a, a, an adjacent question here, um, which is something that has come up uh, a lot in the news, which is understanding the Biden administration's reason for keeping refugee lum numbers low um, is, is the, you know, I, I don't know if anybody has a line into the Biden administration, but if you were um, pontificating as to why that has not been raised prior to now, given that it was a campaign promise. 
Uh, is it something to handle the influx of uh, new migrants or to address this backlog by preventing? I, I, don't, I don't understand uh, exactly what the question is after, but maybe that can give you guys some uh, something to feed off of there. Chris, let, let me jump off on this one. Uh, because I think that, that there, there are two things at work here, right? I think one is, as is, is we've seen, just the logistical capabilities, given the, the surge in numbers that we saw at the early part of this year, that the Biden administration had to move folks around. So there was that piece, okay? But again, I'm always gonna come at it with that, with that political piece and, and the strategy, and I do not have a direct line into the Biden administration, far from it. So I, I'm just, crystal balling here from afar in Austin, Texas. But what I will say is that most folks don't know the difference between asylum and refugees. They don't. And so when they are seeing the surges at the border of mainly asylum claims or folks who want asylum, in, in their brain, asylum and refugee is all the same. So in seeing a Biden administration raising that ceiling, it, it may seem to folks who are not in the know of immigration policy, like, well, why, why is President Biden doing that? You know, isn't that just inviting more people in, even though we know that the refugee piece comes from abroad and is vetted in the State Department and blah, blah, blah. So from a political point of view, that is what I read into it, Chris, but I would be happy to, to hear what my colleagues have, especially the ones who do have a more direct line into the administration. Yeah, I, I just build on that to say they are two separate systems. So an asylum seeker sets foot on U.S. soil first and then claims asylum and a refugee gets screened for that overseas first. And so the refugee and it, it's it's different. It's some of the same agencies, but it's a different set of procedures. And it's very complicated with regard to refugees. They have to be screened by U.S. citizenship and immigration services, working with international agencies to figure out who is the most needy among the refugees to choose them and also be sure that they, they meet the refugee definition. Then there are tons of, since 9-11 attacks, there have been tons of security um, clearances they have to go through, multiple agencies. That takes a long time. Then they go through the U.S. Department of State, which arranges their travel to the United States and funding for their initial first few weeks of resettlement, which is then dispersed to nonprofit organizations around the country to actually do that initial resettlement. And then a third federal agency, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, takes over and provides case management and support services for up to five years. And so that each of those components kind of has to have the capacity and functioning and each of them deteriorated under the Trump administration. The Trump administration withdrew the refugee screeners. Some of them they sent to the borders as asylum seekers and reassigned for other things. There was a lot of attrition at the Department of State, something like 15 to 20 percent of foreign service officers resigned or quit under Trump. And the Office of Refugee Resettlement was retooled to deal with the border and the unaccompanied children that they also have responsibility for. And I think the Biden administration just saw everything that had to be done through all these complex procedures and, and didn't couldn't quickly figure out a way to, to change it, given the complexity. That said, there are supposedly 35,000 people already in the pipeline, already had passed both the humanitarian vetting and this and security screenings that should have been able to be admitted relatively quickly. And I think it's an open question as to why the Biden administration hasn't been able to act more quickly on those cases. I think the only, the only thing that I would add there, Chris, is um, what, what mystified me about their decision is that all those pieces are absolutely true, right? But at the end of that pipeline, you have state offices of refugee resettlement. You have large resettlement organizations at the national level, but at the community level, you have just this incredible ecosystem of organizations and churches um, that have worked across the political spectrum to resettle refugees for decades. So, you know, politically, it, it, you know, so functionally, I can, okay, I can understand, like, you got to put all those pieces together. But politically, you know, a big reason why refugee resettlement is so, has such deep support in the country is because of that infrastructure across the country. And I just, I, I felt like the Biden administration was, um, you know, just kind of didn't make that a part of their calculus at all. Understood. Thank you for those uh, those insights. I I want to um, look here as well at um, there is a, a conversation here about um, the humanization of um, of 
immigrants, and which was touched on toward the end of the panel, of course. Um, so what is the, the core challenge there when we're looking at all of these metrics, uh, just to say, um, not just about the humanization of um, of the people that are trying to come to America, but also the challenges that people pay, face in the country when we're trying to prioritize, whether it's um, political capital or uh, monetary uh, resources. Uh, when people are looking at trying to address something at the border or trying to address something in a foreign country that might create push factors to send people here, there is a challenge of understanding the prioritization of American citizens, uh, residents, and the issues that are happening domestically with trying to address the border. And then on the other side of that, uh, trying to address the push factors that send people here. How do we find a happy balance with the, uh, with the different desires that Americans have uh, for um, prioritization of American domestic issues with also solving the challenge of people trying to come to America and using kind of uh, trying to go around the system, perhaps because the, there's not a way for them to come in. All right, let me let me see if I can unpack that. That's a lot of punch right there. Uh, I think the challenge is obviously to me the challenge is the president has to talk about it and and talk about it quite a bit. Despite everything, I think Americans still listen to the president. I mean, even Donald Trump was listened to by the middle and and reasonable people trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. I think Americans are still used to listening to the president. So he's got the power of the pulpit. He's got to do that work. That's why I said he's got to get on the road. Number one. Number two. Uh, he's got to work on the immigration system. I mean, the court system, the entire chain, right? The court system, the refugee system, the asylum system, the uh, the backlog of cases that are still there, uh, humanizing eyes, I think, and giving new instructions to the system, growing the, the court system. And then he's got to work with Congress to see if he can get anything there done, DACA. And of course, I think Kamala Harris is charged with working with Central American nations. And that's going to be a very difficult thing because on the one hand, those countries, I mean, I've been to Honduras and Salvador and to Guatemala, and I can tell you the conditions are so awful there. I would try to get out if I lived there, if I were a Salvadoran or a Honduran living in San Pedro Sula or someplace like that. I would just try to get the hell out of there. So clearly the president has to recruit the private sector. He has to work with those presidents despite who they are and the fact that they're being questioned in Washington and so on. So I think the, the president's challenge is going to be to address everything at once. He can no longer give himself the luxury like Trump did to say, hey, the border is shut down, push everything into Mexico and let that be the end of it. That's our solution. Build a wall and that's the end of it. I don't think that that Biden has that that luxury any longer. Would anyone else like to add to that? Yeah, I would like to add, you know, I mean, historically it was Mexico. Mexico has a lot lower standard of living in, than the U.S., but things improve there. Uh, demographic changes, or, you know, they're having a slower population growth that helps um, better jobs, better economic opportunities post the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, there's been some deterioration in the last year or two with COVID and with violence. But, you know, Mexico is a big country. The other countries we're talking about, El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras together, maybe around 30, a little bit more than 30 million people. They're not huge countries. Um, and so a little bit of investment could go a long way. And yes, there are corrupt officials, there are problems with, with crimes and, and gangs and, and the like and drug trafficking, but um, they may be easier to solve on a smaller scale. And, and the Biden administration is doing more, I believe, comprehensively than any other administration before to try to tackle corruption through some sanctions they recently announced potentially on corrupt individuals through, um, you know, restarting U.S. aid programs. I mean, they're, they're, I'm, I'm optimistic. And if you look at the most recent months of data, actually the numbers of people coming from El Salvador are not that high anymore. It's really more Guatemala and Honduras. It's becoming more of a two country than a three country flow. And that's because El Salvador's population is not growing very quickly anymore. Uh, despite the issues with the Salvadoran government, um, it's, it's, it's somewhat popular among the public and there's been a big decline in violence there. So there are even small steps in the right direction in small countries could make a big difference. So I'm very optimistic that if this administration and the American public understand what needs to happen in the region, it, it could take a while, but I think we'll see results. 
All right. So we have time for a quick lightning round. I'd love for each four of you to, uh, including Ali, to uh, jump in on this one. Um, the, the question, which uh, originally was going to be what Ali asked you guys last. So uh, thanks, Ali, for stealing my uh, lightning round question, is um, if you were to try to speak to the, if you had a pulpit to speak to the American public at large, what is the what is the approach that you would take to helping people understand the complexity of the situation at the border? And what would you prioritize uh, in terms of your um, approach? I don't want to say rhetoric, but in terms of your um, your speech to help people come together on this issue. And we can start. Let's start with uh, let's start with Tony. Yeah, look, uh, I, I think the president has a lot of power to make the public understand that the border is a very complex place. Somebody mentioned Nebraska or Kansas or kind of the middle of the country, you know, sitting in the middle of the country and not understanding the border. Look, the border is a place with $630 billion of trade every single year. It is, Mexico is always ranking third, second, and sometimes even first beyond China and Canada as the number one trading partner. A lot of uh, uh, activity, business activity in Texas depends on, on, uh, on an open border, a well-managed border. And so I would try to see if I could re retool the institutions to do more bi-national border management. So far, I think the, the, the bureaucracies, and I wrote a piece a long time, a long time ago saying, oh, you know, these two countries are back to back. The, 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 the agencies, the bureaucracies on the, on the ground don't even speak to each other. I mean, I, I crossed the border in Juarez, I crossed the border in Tijuana, and I can tell you they're, they're, they're really completely doing their own thing and they don't communicate very well. So I think we need new structures to, for uh, joint border management. And I think it's something new. Recently, we wrote another book called Binational Commons. We need to define the border as a commons for both countries and create the institutional structures to manage it that way. Everything, trade, security, immigration, environmental issues. We saw the issues with water last year. So I think the border needs to be managed differently. And I would, I would invite the administration to reconsider the way the U.S. has managed the border for the last uh, since the, uh, literally 1994, I think, with Operation Hold the Line. That's, that's really not, not acceptable any longer. Understood. Thank you, Tony. Um, Randy, let's go to you. Sure. I'd say in this context, I just mentioned that this is not a huge problem, that the numbers aren't the same numbers that, say, Europe is facing. There's really two things that we have to do, manage the flow better. And as I mentioned, a lot of that has to do with the asylum system and making it be fair, uh, but also efficient. And the second thing is addressing the root causes of the migration. And here, I, again, I think the Biden administration is on the right uh, track. It, it's, it's rule of law in, in, in those countries, it's economic development, it's um, addressing and reducing violence, and it's being prepared to address natural disasters. You know, one thing we didn't mention here is there are a couple of major hurricanes recently in Honduras and Guatemala that, that really pushed a lot of people northward. Um, there's There have been some successes, some ups and downs, some successes in Mexico over the years and more recently with El Salvador. And I think if we really put our heads around it and work cooperatively with the right people in the region, we can do it in Honduras and Guatemala as well. Thank you, Randy. Victoria. I would point to the most recent census numbers that came out, the ones that show that we are at a near 40 year low in terms of our population. Our rates of fertility keep going down even among Latinas who tended to have the highest birth rates. And so if our birth rates continue to go down and if we continue to be a restrictionist immigration country, we're setting ourselves on the path of Japan and other countries that aren't replacing themselves. And, and you know, the implications for that are first of all, who's gonna pay into social security, you know, and, and funding our social safety net, but also then who is going to take care of us in terms of workforce, in terms of healthcare workers, in terms of the functioning of our society. So I think that instead of always viewing immigration growth and numbers as a bad thing, understanding that this growth is not only good, but needed, given the numbers that we've most recently seen. Thank you so much, Victoria. Ali, bring us home. So I guess I would say that, um, you know, whether you are a Central American or a, you know, you live here in the States, you want to have confidence that your country is going to enforce the rule of law um, and keep all of us safe. So I think that 
the, the Biden administration should move forward with measures in Central America to root out corruption, um, you know, engaging the Organization of American States and other institutions that have expertise in terms of really challenging the power, the elite powers in Central America to root out corruption. And then at the US-Mexico border, let's invest the resources that are necessary to actually address real risks to public safety. Um, because when you look at the data, the amount of drugs, guns, and money still being smuggled through ports of entry is astronomical. So if we're gonna be spending taxpayer dollars on border security, let's spend those taxpayer dollars at a place in the places where there are the greatest risks. And when you invest in a secure port of entry, not only are you mitigating the smuggling of drugs, guns, and money, but you're also facilitating trade and tourism that helps both sides of the border. Understood. Thank you so much uh, to our panel uh, focused on the challenge at the southern border of the United States. Uh, Ali, Victoria, Randy, Tony, um, I appreciate you. And if you would like to hang around, there are some questions we didn't get to. You're uh, Feel free to type answers into those if you have time. Um, if not, we will try to address them at future events. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we now have uh, a panel coming up that is going to be focused on the question of earned citizenship and a pathway to residency. Uh, this was brought up a few times in our previous panel, so I know that we're very excited to get to dive into that. But first, we're going to play a short film. It's seven minutes long that will help set the table for the, the history and process of becoming a United States citizen. And we're going to roll that now. It is definitely not easy to become a lawful permanent resident of the United States. As we call it, get a green card. The Supreme Court has said that next to the tax code, immigration law is the second most complex area of law that exists. So we basically say that there's four big categories of permanent immigration to the United States. Family reunification, employment-based visas, refugees and asylees, and the diversity lottery program. The main way that individuals permanently immigrate to the United States is through what we call the Family Reunification Program. The first step for family reunification is the family petition. That's a certain form where a lawful permanent resident or a U.S. citizen says, I want this particular family member to immigrate to the United States. Not just any family member can sponsor you. You have to be related to them in one of specific ways. It's your spouse, kids, parents, brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens. That's about as far away as you can get in terms of distant relatives. This is what is being referred to today as chain migration. It's true that you may request a green card for family members, but there's priorities. Spouses have priority, children have priority, but all the other relatives have to be placed in a queue. And then each country receives a number of visas that is capped that wait can range from a couple of years to 20 to 25 years, depending on which category you're in and which country you're from. Relatives also have to submit an affidavit of support indemnifying the federal and state governments against means-tested benefits. Generally, if you're an immediate relative, that spouse and minor kid of a U.S. person, the line's going to be shorter and faster. And as you get to parents and adult children and brothers and sisters, the lines grow longer. Although two-thirds of individuals who immigrate to the United States permanently come through the Family Reunification Program, there's also employment-based visas. High-skilled immigration is possible if you've got a college degree maybe a master's degree in engineering, science, very specialized areas. You're gonna to have to have an employer who offers you a job, puts that job out on the market to find out if there's any other U.S. workers available. It can take anywhere from six months to two years for that petition to be available. If they can secure an employer who is willing to sponsor them for a visa, then they are permitted to apply for that, which is a non-immigrant visa. It can eventually turn into a green card, but it certainly is not permanent status at first. After you've applied, there's no guarantee that you're going to receive it. There's a cap that Congress put on those of basically 85,000. 265,000 applications came in, and they do a lottery for this. You go through all the trouble of filing this application, 85,000 lucky people get these approved, and some win the lottery and still get them denied. So lots and lots of things stand in the way between somebody who wants to come here to work or an employer that needs a, a worker and a legal pathway to do it. 
once their visa becomes available, then they apply for their permanent residency or green card. And at that point, that is where your background, your criminal history, your immigration history are all evaluated to find out if you are admissible or if you trigger grounds of inadmissibility, which are reasons inside the law for excluding an individual. To be able to breathe the air in the United States as a lawful permanent resident, you have to do a medical exam that includes blood tests, an exam of tattoos on your body, a mental health assessment, an assessment of whether you've ever been an alcohol or drug abuser, in addition to a test for you to find out if you have any diseases. They submit their mother and father's names, date of birth, place of birth, country of residence. They talk about your siblings, your work history, your height, your weight, every little thing about you. And then all of that information is submitted to Department of Homeland Security, who has all of the resources to vet that information and check you against databases all over the world. The process of doing a background check just to come over as a refugee could take three years, easy. The point here is that to enter the country legally is one of limited opportunity. To go through the multiple steps necessary to pay the fees to get to legal permanent residence is incredibly difficult. Our law sets out to try to allow lots of ways for people to come in, but in reality, it's fairly restrictive. And because of these long backlogs and waits, even if there's a line you theoretically can get into, how many people are going to wait 20 or 30 years for a visa? If you're in really desperate straits, that's not really a viable means for you to try to come in. And for many people, many workers who want to come to the United States to do particularly less skilled labor, the thing that we really have the greatest demand in our economy for, there's no line to get in. There is no temporary worker program for less skilled workers who are working in the year-round economy. But if you're working day in and day out all year long as an employer and you need the immigration system to give you a foreign-born worker, the answer from the immigration system is no. You just take the average person in the world that wants to immigrate to the U.S. It's impossible. One, they don't have the close family relationship. Or two, there's no way they can create a relationship with an employer that's willing to sponsor them in a position for which there's a shortage of U.S. workers. Sometimes you hear people saying, oh, get in line like everybody else. Well, they don't realize that for them there is no line. The way I think about it is if you look at the Statue of Liberty where it says, you know, give me your tired and your poor and your huddled masses and all, it should say, you know, give me your relatives and then give me your engineers and your scientists. And the, the poor people, they have no path to come into this country. To your everyday American, it doesn't make sense. But I guess the law is not meant to make sense. The law is just meant to restrict who comes to the United States. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm Melissa Brandon and I'm the production coordinator for The Rational Middle. And we are so happy to have you here with us today. Uh, I have loved watching this audience grow and grow, uh, seeing familiar friends in the audience, seeing some new faces. So we're thrilled to have you with us today. And, and I hope everyone has had the opportunity to watch along uh, with our Lines and Limitation episode just now because it is such a fantastic transition into our next panel on the pathway to earn citizenship. And you might just recognize our moderator. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to bring Jill Campbell up to the stage. Uh, Jill is Baker Ripley's Director of Immigration and Citizenship, where she leads a team of professionals to bring legal services to Houston's immigrant communities and community members. Jill's immigration work focuses on pathways to permanent legal status, citizenship, removal defense, and humanitarian relief programs. She is currently a member of the Houston Immigration Legal Services Collaborative Executive Committee, the Mayor's Advisory Council on New Americans, and the Houston's Food Bank's Board of Advocacy Committee. Jill's interest in the broken immigration was spurred by her experiences as a student at the University of Miami and the University of Texas Law School. So Jill, we'll welcome you on. Hi, thank you. And you can tell how COVID has aged me a little bit from that video I filmed three years ago. Um, so uh, thank you so much. And so I'll go ahead and uh, introduce our panelists that we have today. 
So I'll start with Charles Foster. Uh, Charles Foster is the chairman of Foster LLP, and he shares a common backyard with me here in Houston, Texas. Uh, his practice currently focuses on representing multinational companies and foreign investors regarding U.S. immigration law. Um, although if we know Charles and his history of immigration, uh, he has done a little bit of everything over the years, um, including a little bit of politics. Uh, he has served as a senior immigration policy advisor to President George W. Bush's 2000 and 2004 presidential campaigns and to Barack Obama's 2008 campaign. Um, so welcome, Charles. Thank you. And a virtual hi across Houston. Um, so next we have Jorge Lima. Uh, so Jorge is the Senior Vice President of Policy um, at Americans for Prosperity and previously served as the Executive and Policy Director for the Libre Initiative, as well as the Vice President of Operations and Policy. He has practiced law in the past with the law firm of Holland and Knight and as an attorney at the City of Miami. And we share a common university as he is also a graduate of University of Miami. We got to throw it up guys, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, also graduated with his JD from Georgetown University. So welcome Jorge. And then last is Alan Orr, who is the founder of Orr Immigration Law Firm based in Washington, DC. His practice focuses on employment-based immigration um, with a focus on US corporate compliance as a global corporate representation, as well as global corporate representation assistance on immigration issues. Um, and I think very notably, he is the current president-elect for the 2021 to 2022 term for the immigration, uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association, of which I think we're, Charles and I are members. Uh, so that is a really large task to be taking on in such an exciting time in immigration. Um, so welcome and um, to Alan Orr. Thank you. Okay, guys. So, um, sorry, calling you guys. There we go. Let's kind of start, I think our task here is really talking about immigration reform, moving away from border issues, right? Kind of focusing on immigration reform for what's going on here. Um, so many groups think that the most urgent issue for immigration reform that must be addressed first is how to get status for the 11 million undocumented individuals who are currently here in the United States. So talking about the undocumented population, what do you guys see as the easiest pathways forward? Um, do you see a pathway forward for legal status, legislative relief for all 11 million undocumented individuals? Do you see a pathway forward for DREAMers and TPS? Uh, is the easiest pathway forward um, modifying um, uh, registry, which was an old uh, a part of the INA where if you've been here since 1972, you could get a green card. Um, is it modifying something that's on the books like that? What, what are you guys right now, uh, this point today, May the 12th with the politics right now, what do you see as the easiest pathway forward? And I'll start with Alan. Sound, turn your sound Thank on. you for starting here. I think uh, a little bit of the issue is that either of those paths would work. What we need is a, a, a dedication to do something on immigration first. So that's the first requirement. And then it shouldn't be one or the other. It should be all of those things in a combination to meet and fill the need of what we need to update and modernize our immigration system. The reason we have these challenges is because this the way immigration works really hasn't been modernized since the 80s. So it's time to open a new door with a new key. Charles, what are your thoughts? Well, like Alan, I would I'd like all of the above. Uh, and uh, as you indicated, I've, I've been working in different capacities on the policy side, uh, seeking uh, immigration reform for, for a number of years. And I've, uh, uh, I don't want to list all the times I thought it was going to pass, something big was going to happen that didn't. So, so even though I'm an optimist, sometimes it's hard to be overly optimistic. And uh, I'm, uh, I would take, I, I think it'd be very important to have uh, anything passed to, uh, to have uh, confidence building measures so that it, and um, in terms, the good news was that President Biden right off the track uh, uh, caused legislation to be introduced, both uh, 
comprehensive immigration reform legislation to be introduced both in the House and the Senate. There's a real, uh, real probability that uh, that legislation would not pass in any form through the Senate as the under the current rules, uh, the filibuster rules. And so there's, there's uh, the idea has been floated of, of reconciliation. Can you get the Senate parliamentarian to rule that they can pass uh, a big immigration bill uh, with a simple majority with uh, maybe a 50-50 vote with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris breaking that tie. But even there, there's a problem because uh, there's a there's at least two or three uh, Democrats that would have a, might have a hard time with that as well. So the given wisdom is that uh, to, uh, to try a small smaller bill, and that would be uh, a dream uh, a form of the Dream Act, uh, hopefully including the TPS beneficiaries. Uh, uh, to me, that looks more uh, promising. Uh, Mitch McConnell says it's got to come. It's got to be matched with something to deal with the quote so-called border crisis. So that so that is uh, uncertain as well. But I think realistically, uh, that's probably the best way to start. If we could do something for the Dreamers, uh, hopefully the TPS beneficiaries get enough uh, 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 Republican votes to go along. Our senator, uh, Jill, your senator, my senator, Senator Cornyn, has indicated that he would, uh, in the past, that he would support a, a, a standalone, uh, freestanding Dream Act by itself assuming that he was okay with the provisions. So uh, so that was encouraging. So I'll stop right there. Do you, before Jorge, before I ask for your opinion, um, Charles, do you think and if if a DREAM Act is passed, as you say, it might be the, the easiest one to get, then everyone would kind of throw their hands up and go, we've done it, it's done. Like, you know, we can stop now. Is there a risk to that? Yes, uh, but then that would, uh, is, I'm sort of an LBJ, half a loaf is better than no loaf at all. So that wouldn't be all bad. That would be a significant number of individuals, particularly uh, since the DREAM Act would cover more, uh, or presumably, than, than the so-called, uh, than, than that was covered under President Obama's 2012 DACA. So that's that's a possibility that Congress would say we've, we've done it, uh, been there, done that. On the other hand, as I said, it could also, if Republicans voted on that and, and their world didn't come to an end and and, and the, uh, the American public sort of went along with it, there was a high, you know, that 60%, 65-70% of the people liked it, maybe that would actually encourage more Republicans to go on to join a bigger bill. Jorge, um, politically, do you see this the same way? Do you think that uh, Dream Act, Dream TPS might be easiest path forward right now? Yeah, I appreciate that, Jill. I mean, I think the, defining the word easy in an immigration context is always hard because of, nothing's easy when it comes to immigration and immigration reform. But um, I think I would echo what, what Charles said here, right? When you think about what is, if we want to say uh, easiest, to me, easiest is actually getting us closer to everything that most of us here want to see, right, which is the true comprehensive immigration reform. We think it starts with some sort of first step. And yes, it may be easier in terms of, of getting implemented if we went the administrative route, but that could present problems when there is an administrative change, as we just saw you know, with, with President Trump after President Obama. And uh, so we would agree that the legislative one seems to be where uh, you have the biggest opportunity to take one piece of the loaf um, to hopefully create the type of momentum or even at least re reduce the heat around the conversation itself. Right. If we take a look at, uh, for example, the criminal justice reform that was completed in 2018, you really saw this approach where, you know, both sides found a way to agree on some measures, even though it was not everything that either side wanted. Um, and while we're still looking for the second act and the next things after that first act on CJR, it has allowed for more robust conversations on both sides of the aisle. And so I would agree if we could take that first step with some sort of package, uh, and I agree with Charles, it's probably Dreamer TPS. Maybe you have opportunities to bring on the ag workers, as we saw, you know, recent bills in the House, or maybe even a portion of essential workers. Um, those are all opportunities. I think it all depends on how Congress figures out what sort of package they want to put together. 
Um, so I think that's where we've got to start that legislative first step. Um, and all of that, going taking it back to how Alan started, begins with a commitment. And you really need leaders to step up and say, we're actually going to do this. We're not just going to host a bunch of meetings, not just going to have conversations, but are committed to finding something that works for both sides. We're seeing some members do that now, and that's encouraging. We just got to make sure that they have the oxygen to do that and that actually have the courage to take it across the finish line. Yeah, I feel like even in my short 11 year career, I feel like we've been at the fin near the finish line so many times and never got there and having some flashbacks right now. Um, so um, let's talk about, so kind of moving away from how we're gonna get status for the undocumented population and talking about the current immigration legal system. One of the main reasons that we have this huge undocumented population in the United States is because of the failure of the current immigration legal system to really work for families, work for employers, work for communities. And as Charles mentioned, no large change in the immigration laws since the 1980s. Um, so what are some changes that we should be making to the current legal immigration system in order for our system to quote unquote work? Um, what needs to be changed to the employment based, family based, humanitarian based? Um, but also I, I would ask you guys to be creative. Should we be bringing in a merit based system on top of programs that we already have? Um, you know, thinking kind of outside the box um, and maybe thinking without political you know, constrictions that are kind of created around this. So I'll pass it, Jorge, to you first. Yeah, I mean, Joe, I mean, I think this is one of the, the areas where at least I get really excited about the conversation because many times when you're talking about broad immigration reform, there's a lot of conversations about legalizing people that are already here. And there's a lot of conversation about the border. But the other piece that we think is critical is legal avenues, right? You, it, the status quo works for no one. As you mentioned, it doesn't work for no immigrant that I know of desires to be undocumented. No employer wants to go through the hoops and rings that it has to to bring in the labor force that it wants, right? None of the communities don't want folks working in the shadows, right? Everybody wants a robust community where folks are contributing uh, to it and living their lives out in the open and as part of a cohesive society, not one where you have folks in in shadows and what have you. And so there needs to be a real robust discussion about what those legal avenues look like so that we can start, as you mentioned, reducing the amount of people who become undocumented because we find and can provide them with options to enter the system legally. I know that some of this was hinted on at the video, but I, you know, I think you're absolutely right. We need to think about family-based works to a certain extent, but perhaps there is room for a merit-based system. I think there's there's rightful skeptics around that, because if the merit based system becomes nothing more but really high criteria that very little can meet, then that doesn't really work. Right. You need a way to define merit that is flexible, that actually takes into account maybe not just degrees, but entrepreneurship and grit. And, you know, a lot of these things that we know immigrants bring with them that really is hard to measure. But I do think there's room in the conversation to bring new ideas in. All of us know that there's been a debate about immigration reform for 30 plus years. And at least we've heard from folks that every time you come to the table, it just feels like you're bringing the same old ideas and putting them back on. And we're having deja vu with the same conversation. But we've seen folks bring ideas like, you know, uh, regional visas or state based visas that allow states to have more skin in the game when talking about the levels of immigration. You have merit-based systems. You have uh, different changes that can allow non-immigrant visas to transition into immigrant visas in a much more easier way. Right now, that wall is too strict and you're not allowing people who have been vetted and are contributing from becoming more permanent members of our society. Those are ideas that I know we've, we've heard, we've been focusing on, and I think could make a huge difference at providing um, those legal avenues that are so desperately needed. So I'll throw it to Alan, um, and maybe with your background, Alan, you can talk about some of the really serious issues in the employment-based immigration system that can really, some changes maybe that could be made to be more responsive to industries that are emerging in the United States and the workforce that we need. Yeah, so I think you've seen the current administration move forward with this already this week with the entrepreneurial rule coming back into play, sort of making that playground. But I think we should learn from our history that, you know, we took INS, made it DHS, and we didn't improve it. We just called it something different. So calling a merit program something without fixing the underlying problem 
doesn't really address the need. And there's a lot of classism in the new sort of talk about immigration reform where we sort of model ourselves around rich countries or rich individuals or individuals who had access to education at a certain time and point. And I'm also very concerned about that because I'm very concerned about African immigrants and some of that elimination. So when we talk about these concerns that sort of meet us, the main concern that goes up is this coupling of criminality and immigration. And we need to separate that. Those are two different conversations. Immigrants and crime do not go together. The border and immigration don't necessarily go together. There's a, there's a nexus there, but everything comes in the country to the border. So why isn't everything linked the same way? The conversations are about the needs that we need to address this. So sort of fixing the system. And part of that fixing the system is a modernization. What we have in the United States right now is a really popular club and we're making everybody wait outside when there's nobody inside just so people driving by thinks there's something going on. And that's just a function of willpower and management. If we want to do things faster, we could. We just went to Mars. We can definitely process cases faster electronically. We can have electronic filing. I mean, why is it in this country that we're actually sending paper files on immigrants anywhere? You can't do your case status online. So modern things that happen with the IRS should be happening right now with DHS and sort of moving those things function and using computer system more. One of the things that happened in the last administration is there's a re-adjudication of every single freaking case and company. Why isn't there just a registry where this is a known company? We're not going to vet the company anymore. We're going to vet the individual. The individual has been vetted once. Why are we going to vet them every four years or every six months? Or that constant vetting and fingerprinting is the silliness that exists that gives you a function that you think that you're safe because you're looking for that one needle in a haystack that might present a problem. But in a global world, as we just also saw this week, your threat isn't from the person down the street. Your threat could be someone outside the country when everything's connected through the internet. So it's really a different way of thinking and advancing our way of processing things so that we're not sitting here going, oh my gosh, I think that that person's a harm. And also the way we sort of take the fees for doing this. The applications that are paid in today are basically paying for someone else's application they didn't do before. So every time a case sits somewhere, just like in an office, in my office, every time I touch a case, I'm losing money on that case. If I'm able to pick up that case and resolve it with one handshake, just this is it, I'm gonna process and move it forward, but sitting it here, then sitting it here, then sitting it there, it's a bad management. And that's what we need, someone to go in there and basically change the management. Whether you do it merit or you keep it the system that it is, it's all about the management. I know it drives me nuts when I think about how much of our resources are wasted at USCIS and DHS on things. And then you try to explain that to a client, the client's looking at you like, I thought this was America. I thought you have systems and ways, you know, of doing things efficiently. And you're like, here's one shining exception to that is, is DHS in many ways. And it's, fr it's frustrating, right? It, it, it's, it's a way to deter people, I think, from trying to pursue, you know, lawful permanent status in the United States. Um, so Charles, any other additions to, to kind of what they said on reforms that we need to see in the current system? Yeah, um, I think that's critical. Uh, as we all know, that the focus is always on the border. Uh, and yet, you could uh, say that uh, the border crisis, to some extent, is a result of a failure of the United States to adapt our immigration system. I always like to point out to people that uh, prior to 1923, when we put on our first uh, quotas, before we had any quantitative or qualitative restrictions, just about everyone coming from Central America and Mexico, as long as they had a job, they would be legal. So we determine who's going to be legal uh, simply of, of how we control that valve, if we open the valve or we, whether we shut the valve. Uh, when I worked for then governor and candidate uh, uh, George W. Bush, which I was very, uh, I'm, I'm more or less independent, but I was delighted to do so because he was someone that had a real chance of being president who really, for him, immigration was really at the top of his agenda. He thought that was very important, so that was very exciting. One of the few things he told me was, he said, why should we have our border patrol gang tackling someone's favorite nanny or, or uh, strawberry picker. Why don't we route them into a legal system? And so uh, I think anyone dealing with policy uh, knows that uh, w one of the problem at the border is we do not have a functioning temporary works, workers program, a uh, low skilled worker program. And yet we need individuals. Immigrants historically have done all the jobs uh, that no one else has wanted to do. And yet uh, we depend today, our our guest worker program that takes care of this is called illegal immigration. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, the given number is 10 or 11 million people. 
what would we do without them? What would we have done without them when the economy was at 3.5 percent? So we're we're lucky in a, I mean, in an ironic way they got here. One one more point I like to make. Uh, I grew up uh, in McAllen, Texas, in the so-called epicenter of this, and worked on various uh, work crews during my life with with uh, Hispanic workers. And I, I quickly discovered many of them were uh, undocumented. They would tell me how they had to come back in. And what struck me as uh, as a youngster was just how casual it was, how easy it was. They thought nothing of going back. Uh, in fact, one guy told me that his idea of coming in illegally was to come under the bridge, look up at the bridge, and when the inspector was looking the other way to, to cross under the bridge. All of that's gone now. We, we've hardened that barter. We spend billions of dollars in border enforcement. We have the most secure border than, than we've ever had. But the as a result of that, we've created a permanent undocumented population because folks that used that I knew that used to come in casually, work within 100 miles of the of the uh, uh, Texas Mexican border, at some point they you know it dawned upon them that was the most difficult, dangerous, riskiest things they ha they ever did. So they just stayed here and either smuggled in their family on a one-time basis or they, start, or they started a new family. So, so we have, so when uh, back in the 50s and 60s, that population would go back and forth. And so uh, when we increase barter enforcement without uh, creating any legal mechanisms for people to come in legally, uh, we created to some extent, Congress created to some extent this undocumented population. So in short, we need a viable temporary workers program. Uh, low-skilled uh, workers program, and yes, we can refine the uh, the preference categories, but we've not increased uh, our populations increased significantly over the years, but we've not in, uh, had any corresponding increase in the overall quota. So we can figure, we can sort of figure, uh, you know, re recalculate uh, or redistribute the numbers, but the the real answer is we need more numbers. We shouldn't be counting derivatives against uh, uh, principal applicants. And it, uh, one more thing uh, on the merit-based system. We, we uh, as Alan knows, we have a merit-based system already. Uh, uh, employment immigration, uh, individuals with exceptional ability, national interest waiver, proving the unavailability of any single U.S. workers, all based upon the needs of the U.S. economy. Thanks. I, oh, someone, um, so. Shifting, we're shifting very dramatically from topic to topic, but um, talking about the politics around the undocumented population and pathways to citizenship, a really hot topic right now is the issue of pathways to U.S. citizenship specifically. Why do you think that pathways to full citizenship, especially when we're talking about pathways for undocumented individuals for full citizenship, are, why do you think that these pathways to citizenship are being used almost like as a bargaining chip in the negotiation around immigration reform? Um, and I'll, I'll let you guys decide who wants to pop in and give an opinion on this. I, I'll start because I've worked on that issue uh, quite a bit. Um, I would like to get my pa co-panelists uh, their opinion, but I, I would say the whole thing it's become one of these issues that I think has little to do with the reality on the ground. Uh, that it, uh, that the people that argue that are not necessarily the ones that are going to be the beneficiaries. So for, it comes up both in the context of, of uh, DACA, DREAM Act legislation, certainly comprehensive immigration reform. On one side, you have an uh, on the Democratic side saying an insistence, there's got to be a pathway to citizenship. Uh, almost the, the idea that that's critical. On the Republican side, that creates a uh, visceral reaction, and that's uh, misinterpreted, certainly within the general so-called Republican base, meaning, oh, you want instant uh, uh, Democratic voters. This is all about getting more demo uh, uh, importing more Democratic voters. So that's, that's misunderstood, and the phrase itself, pathway to citizenship, sort of, in some ways, uh, will, will do that. Uh, Luis Gutierrez, some of you may know, was a great advocate for uh, immigration reform, and he once said, stop the bleeding, that in terms of DREAM Act legislation, he would take, again, quoting uh, Lyndon Johnson, the half loaf. Uh, if it's necessary to put, uh, to have legislation, to put them in the equivalent of, 
the, the legislative equivalent of DACA. So they have a, le a permanent legal status that's renewable. It's no pathway to citizenship. That's better than having a talking point uh, without accomplishing anything. I actually think that's going to that's going to be the way to pass pass that. Now, ironically, when you talk to the to the people who want a status, they're not arguing they're not arguing for a pathway to citizenship. They're not saying, "Gosh, I mean, my life's a failure if I can't register to vote." They're trying to have the security, the confidence, the ability to uh, to work legally, uh, not to live in fear, the ability to go home to their mother's funeral, and yes, yeah, citizenship is nice. Now, two or three more points on that. If um, uh, you you may know the uh, Immigration and Control Act of uh, of eighty six IRCA, that was a, a direct uh, path to uh, legal residency uh, on a conditional basis, and uh, the individuals that applied somewhere around eighty six uh, some somewhere around eighty seven or so uh, eighty eight eighty nine they they obtained their conditional residency and. That started the clock for them to, uh, within five years, to be eligible to become a U.S. citizen, without any citizenship, without any uh, English language tests or civics tests, because they had already taken it. Interestingly, statistics show some 40 years later, uh, 40, 50 years later, only about 40 percent of that population ever got around to applying for citizenship. Because why? Because it was a nice thing to do. It was a big filing fees. So uh, I, I think we should. I, I was working for President Obama, and when he went down to Guadalajara, one of my few contr uh, few contributions was I got them to t uh, to change the speech uh, and drop that term "pathway to citizenship" to "pathway to legal uh, legal status" for, uh, to, to lawful status, because again, it unnecessarily inflamed the opposition, uh, and we're really talking about, in any event, a pathway to lawful permanent residency. Whether someone someday will apply for citizenship is completely optional. Alan, Jorge? I agree with that sentiment 100%. Yeah, I would agree, right? I mean, I think you, especially Charles's point about the confusion of, of the issue itself and how it's not connected to really what, what the people who would be most impacted are having. Um, but the the politics loom here, right? And it is it is used for a talking point. I think it's it's lazy governing. Um, they know that you can utilize the citizenship issue to quickly define your opponent as either, you know, trying to smuggle in voters or hating people, right? And you use that really effectively rather than describing all of the nuances of the immigration debate and having a real conversation about, well, what does it mean? to welcome people to, that want to be further integrated into society and further integrated into our communities. I mean, that's, that's what citizenship actually means, right? This progression of individuals who come, identify and want further integration. And so from our perspective, you definitely wanna keep that door open. Now, how that, that is created is really where the debate should live. But I think politicians don't wanna have that debate. They'd much rather have the talking point and I think who ends up losing, as Charles mentioned, are the people who would be impacted because politicians get the talking point and the communities and immigrants end up with another decade of not getting any reform. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I think I think from my end, so they are all naturalizing now, Charles. I'm naturalizing all those amnesty folks. And it's because they were working really hard over the last 30 years and they finally retired. And when they retired, they decided it was time to naturalize. <laughs> Many said that they could go back to Mexico, you know, for like eight, nine months at a time, uh, you know, not into their retirement homes. But I think I think there's a danger if you create certain statuses that can never become citizens, right? And then you're basically creating a subclass of people in the United States. And I think we should just be super cognizant about doing that through through you know legal means. Um, but yeah, I think the politics of it and the way you phrase it is really important. Um, so I do want to get to this question, and I know we've only got a few minutes left, but I do think that this question is really relevant to right now. Um, it's also a leading question, and as an attorney, I know I'm never supposed to do that, so, you know, forgive me. Um, but the last year in the United States, we've really had a reckoning with a lot of this really serious inequities um, surrounding our criminal justice system and our Black and Brown community members. 
the current immigration law um, can give you a, sometimes a lifelong ban on immigration status for minor offenses, including cannabis offenses. And many of the even progressive immigration bills that are proposed right now specifically exclude immigrants from legal status for misdemeanor offenses. Um, as Jorge pointed out, criminal justice reform is a bipartisan issue. Isn't it time for our immigration laws to also evolve and confront the fact that racial inequities exist in the criminal justice system? And by creating these criminal, you know, criminal history exclusions is just kind of further perpetuating the harm against our black and brown communities. And I'll let whoever has an opinion on that pipe in. Awesome. I'll start. I mean, I think the numbers for the from ICE support the concept that black and brown immigrants suffer more at the hands of enforcement. And it's not just the in the immigration system, it's also the policing and the treatment. Uh, a lot of the masking of what you see in detention centers makes you speak of a certain population of immigrants when it might in fact be a different population than you think of at first, specifically those that are having the most harm done to them and that are caught in very unique situations, even those that were at the, at the southern border that were brought up in the earlier conversation. So I think that, you know, immigration is not separate from the economy and from the criminal issue that goes on, as well as the, the justice issue that is sort of moving forward. And they are all interconnected and that they all have to be addressed at the same way. And understanding in these immigration situations, which really plays out in DACA, when you see that there's a higher number of women that applied for DACA than men because they had some interaction that precluded them from having that benefit that your kid probably had some higher interaction from. And the concept that if an American kid does it, it's okay, we'll give you this. And if, but if someone foreign national does it, then, then it's harm for the rest of your life. So I think there's a little bit of understanding what we mean by criminal justice and the system, because as we've already understand, many of these people are not leaving and you just create that underclass that you were talking about before. And by putting them in detention or giving them back to a gang only pushes them into the exact society and place that you don't want them to be. And it creates the harm that you're willing to adjust. You know, I am a big comic book reader and I thought every kid that was separated at the border becomes that master villain in every episode for the next decade that we have to look back and say, we did that, we created that. It's a, it's a firm understanding that we participate in that under our own constitution. So I do feel, and I will say that that equity is not just beyond the undocumented. It is perpetrated through every level of immigration, the diversity visa, the H-1B selection, the processing, the screening, the bans that were supposedly based on religion that could also have been based on class and also color. I think those things are super important and that we have our blinders off that we say, okay, is this really about immigration or is this about something else? Yeah, Charles, Jorge. I would just add to piggyback on, on what Alan's talking about. I think there's a, uh, the issue is complex and you've really got to ask similar to what we asked in CJR, right? Like what is the purpose of our enforcement systems? What is the purpose of, of our deportation systems, right? And if, if, if people, or even of just our immigration system writ large, right? And if all you see is the, the constant uh, application of a system that's just meant to keep people out at all costs and that it's being utilized in a way that's not designed for what I believe most Americans believe immigration should be about, which is to have a welcoming system that attracts the best while still keeping America secure. You've got to ask the question of how we're actually applying that system and what are some root uh, issues with it that need to be addressed. Um, there's a similarity as well on, and I think this is what you're hinting at, Jill, a little bit, is that uh, similar to CJR, there's a lot of talk about what it means to be formally incarcerated and how that should not automatically ban you from life uh, after that. It shouldn't mark you or scar you for life. Anyone that goes through that system, sh that shouldn't define them. That is not their defining moment. And we have to understand that people do have second chances and that there are still opportunities for people to contribute and not to be judged on their worst day. Um, I think those are really deep questions that need to be asked as we were doing in the CJR context that also need to be done on the immigration side. Now, of course, there are some differences that have to be accounted for, right? They are two different systems there. I think there is a reason to look at criminal history when you're going through immigration systems. But if it is done in a way where you, again, are just blanket keeping people out or using it in a way that's not to the true purpose of what's it intended for, then America needs to ask itself the question and figure out what reforms are needed. Thanks. Yeah, I know it's so hard to explain to, to people you know, our system is supposed to, once you've served your time, once you've finished your community service, 
you should be able to move on with your life. Oh, wait, stop. If you're a foreign born person in the United States, it's different for you, right? It's just antithetical, I think, to the way Americans perceive it. Charles, did you want to add something? Yeah, you know, I, I just uh, subscribe to the views of Alan and Hardy. They said it very well. I just had, uh, had a couple of uh, minor points. Uh, unfortunately, when you combine uh, the complexities of immigration with with uh, with cri uh, criminal reform, that gets very hard because uh, there's not big constituents in Congress for for e either immigrants or any individual with any type of criminal record. So it makes it difficult. The other thing is 287G. It's it's not just uh, uh, people being excluded, uh, but who's who's being detained. And uh, we all know that. Uh, that, that has been used to detain people who've been arrested for relatively minor uh, offenses where they're brought to the attention of ICE. And on, uh, since, Jill, you pointed out we're speaking from Houston, I think we're, we're both pleased that our sheriff, sheriff uh, uh, Ed Gonzalez, has been, is uh, Joe Biden's nominee to be the new head of ICE, and hopefully he'll, he'll bring, uh, he's very, I know, I know him, he's very sensitive about that issue, and, and of course, pulled Harris County out of the 287G program. Yeah. Thank you guys for your input. And so I think it's time to go to Q&A, which the Rational Mill team is going to manage for us. Thank you, Jill. And I'm back, uh, Jill. <laughs> And, and our panel, thank you so much. It was such a really spirited, uh, thoughtful conversation. And Jill, I'm excited because now I'm able to invite you to join your panelists and we're gonna get you to weigh in a little bit as well. Uh, we have had quite a few questions coming through. Uh, I'm guessing all of you will have an opinion. So uh, the first one I'm gonna start with is um, this one from one of our attendees. Um, should we try to build a merit-based immigration system or does that create an even more complicated political challenge? So for me, I think it does create a more complicated challenge. And I think it becomes the distraction because that's what you have to worry about is someone saying, okay, we're just gonna done with this and we're gonna go do something else. And that's what the United States does really well in foreign policy that led to a lot of the problems that we have at the Southern border, as well as the backlog that we currently have in the immigration system by basically saying, you know what, I started that, I'm not gonna finish it. So it, it does become a distraction for me. And I also think that it becomes a very class-based system. I, I would say, as I mentioned earlier, and I won't dwell upon this, we, we have a merit-based system. And if you look at our employment uh, a preference system, but there's a joke that I hear some immigration lawyers say, Canada has a, a merit-based system, and that's why they have so many uh, cab, cab drivers driving with, uh, with PhD degrees. That's, there is a joke in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll laugh at it, Charles. I'll laugh at it. But I, I do think, I mean, I think Alan's point is true that depending on how it's framed, this could be completely a distraction. But to what you said, Charles, there already is uh, a merit based component to our system. And I think if we are going to honestly look at and have the opportunity to look at our system at large, there should be a conversation about how we're going to allow individuals that don't have family connections. There are great immigrants that don't have that and a system that is so heavily weighted to that being your way in. I think we need to be honest and have a conversation about how you can allow individuals that don't have family connections but could be incredible contributors to our country to be part of it. Now, that comes, as Alan mentioned, you've got to, we've got to be really kind of have our guardrails up and make sure that we're not letting that conversation just be hijacked, similar to the same comments we made on the citizenship question, right? All of these things present a certain amount of risk. But if we really are looking at an opportunity to change the immigration system, we've got to be able to talk about individuals coming in that don't have family ties. Anyone else care to comment on that or shall we move on to our next? All right, well, Jill, I'm gonna let you comment on this one if you'd care to. Um, I'm not sure if you were able to join us for the border panel, but but there was um, talk in the last one about the dire situation of our population with the recent uh, census results coming out. Do we need immigrants to become citizens or is it enough to allow them to become residents without voting rights or be able to access social programs? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack on that. Right, so, <laughs> just a small um, So I think, um, no, no one's required to become a citizen in the United States. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about our immigration system is that no one, when clients come in, if they don't want to become a U.S. if they're an LPR and for some reason 
there's a reason they don't want to become a citizen, we can respect that decision. You can stay in a, a lawful permanent resident for the rest of your life. So no one's legally required to become a U.S. citizen. Um, I, I do I do have a little bit of a different opinion when, when people kind of say, well, a lot of these people don't want to become citizens. They just want legal status here. And I think that fails to kind of really acknowledge who you're talking to. You're talking to someone who's incredibly scared, someone who is in fear every single day of losing their family, who's living usually financially on the edge every single day because of their lack of employment authorization. And yes, today they do just want protection and want legal status in the United States. Um, give that person the stability, right? And, and you'll see improvements in their interest in investing in, in their community, um, you know, building a career, buying a home. And I, I, so I think that saying, well, they just want a, a legal status is, I, I just personally don't agree with that all the time. I do think that everyone does want to become a full citizen, a full citizen and full citizenship rights. That is what, this is who we are as Americans, right? That we, we have a democracy and we can be involved in that. Um, so yeah, again, I kind of go back to like, if you're creating legal statuses that are prohibited from ever becoming a US citizen, you're kind of, I think, getting into a little bit of dangerous territory of creating two different types of people in our country. And you see that system in many other countries across the, across the world. And we don't want to model ourselves off those countries that refuse to give full citizenship rights to certain individuals. So, um, so, I mean, I do think that you can help economic issues, right? Um, issues with certain industries needing employees through uh, low skill labor programs and employment-based visas. Um, and we do have non-immigrant visas. We have visas that are never intended on becoming green cards. But I think if you're gonna give people pathways to green cards, you have to allow them to have pathways. The, the ability after five years to apply for US citizenship, just like everyone else. Go chill. Um, would, would anyone else care to weigh in on that particular question? I would just say one thing. I agree with Jill, but if the proposition is, do you do you pass a bill without that? With with uh, where you just put people into a long term legal status, renewable legal status, but but, but it does not lead to uh, uh, it does not lead to lawful permanent residency, or do you get nothing? I would always take something. Uh, put all those people into a legal status on the, on the, with the idea that you can always go back and revisit that and change the law. So, so if, if, that's, if it's necessary, I agree with what, uh, what, you, what you say, Jill, but in order to pass a bill, it may, it may be necessary to pass something that does not provide a direct pathway to lawful permanent residency. I just think there's a huge distinction between do you need to include a, a pathway to citizenship in a bill versus do you ban citizenship in a bill? That's um, I, so to your point, Joe, I mean, I think, and even to the, the, the individual who prompted the question, I think hands down, America needs pathway to citizenship because we want to be a country where people who come and contribute here love it so much that they feel they want to take an oath and officially become part of our fabric. I mean, that that is... How can nobody want that? I think that's, a, that's the country I think we all want and need. Um, I think the, the, the difference is on the first step or how we get there, um, what, is, what is palatable now when we've seen th three decades of nothing on immigration and just an increase of people living in undocumented and in the shadows, where can we start from, right? Even DACA is an example of this. President Obama's program was a program that did not provide citizenship. It was some sort of legal status. And at the time, I agree, was, was rightfully celebrated because it gave people relief. Now we've got to talk about what the next step is for that population and others. Um, but I, I do think there's a huge distinction between just, we're, that, that, are we talking about banning citizenship for, for a certain population or just making sure that that's preserved for another day? Um, and depending on how the legislation shapes out, I think there, that's a, two different ways of looking at it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of touching upon that, um, Kind of taking it another direction and then kind of thinking about maybe from a from a um i don't even quite know how to phrase it so i'm just going to read the question um so this next question is also coming from our our audience uh is it better to focus on the challenge of getting americans secure financially and health wise before we start a robust campaign to change the immigration system they asked. <laughs> um, they're, they're one in the same. They're exactly. connected. That's the answer. They're the same thing. <laughs> they're not different. They're the same. As we talk, just talked about the U.S. population and the growth, I think 
the concept of limited supply and this pie is not the way that the US is set up or the way it's ever been set up. So this limited resource conversation is bogus. This uh, fallacy of employment is bogus. There's not a lump of jobs. The more people you bring in, the more jobs you sort of create. Um, so I think uh, education is, is, the, is the root of that. And the conversation is that immigration should not be partisan and it should not be under the concept that if someone comes, they're taking something away from me because we don't have birth limitations anywhere. We, so if an American wanted to have 20 kids in your neighborhood, are they taking something from you too? So that conversation needs to sort of be, it's an educational thing, right? That you just sort of think someone's coming to take something from you. When in fact, as, as discussed in the prior panel, they're coming in to pay for your social security so you can retire. Anyone else wanna follow that? Well, I think it's interesting that you kind of, I mean, it is something that we hear a lot, that kind of immigrant threat narrative uh, that somehow they're coming here. Are there ways to kind of start shifting that narrative that, that you've seen like kind of starting to work, whether it's a more grassroots effort, if it's something like with communities or is there something more nationally we can do to begin to change that conversation? Uh, that's a question I've rest, wrestled with for years. And uh, I always use this story. There's a, a very well-known member of Congress uh, Republican, conservative, but very rational, very intelligent. And I'd had multiple conversations with him on, on the issues at different, as different votes were coming up. And uh, one point, uh, sort of a uh, aha moment to me was when he said to me, he said, Charles, so I'm gonna tell you a secret. He said, I will deny this, but this is a secret. He said, I, I agree with everything you say. You're right, you win, I give up, but I will never vote that way because the moment I vote that way, I will have uh, a primary opponent. He was Republican. They will run against me. And no matter what I vote on, it will be labeled amnesty. So uh, so, so I, I had up until that time, I was thinking that, you know, that I, I and others would be able to persuade these uh, reelected uh, people who were not going to vote our way. Uh, but that was really a, a sort of an opening moment where it didn't make any difference what we were going to say. They were never going to vote that way because of the political so uh, situation, the way their districts were constituted. So how do we how do we change that? I don't I don't know. Other than it's got to be it's it's pure hard knuckle politics. You've got to win enough elections with enough people who see your way that are going to change the law, and then once it's changed, they learn to live with it. But uh, how, how you change uh, the, uh, the opinion of the, I, I would for lack of a better term, of the, uh, of the conservative base that sees immigration as a zero sum game. I, I don't know how we do not have, I, at one point I was raising lots of money to do that, but we'll ne we'd never have the big voice that uh, the conservative uh, commentators would have, for example, in, on, on Fox News in the evening. We'd never have that big of a voice. Well, I think it's important that one of those large voices who have been on our show several times worked for, for Reagan, I believe, or at least for Bush and Reagan in some connection. But I was a Reagan Republican, not anymore. I mean, not a Republican anymore, but Reagan was behind immigration. It wasn't a partisan issue at the time. He's the one who passed the last sort of concept of amnesty that failed because they just passed it without doing the corrective work afterwards. So I don't think that partisan thing sort of works as strong because every party, even the libertarians have a strong reason to sort of get in line behind this conversation. So then what becomes is just the willpower that you talked about before and those people who show up in the polls and vote like in Georgia and the concept then becomes this one of belonging in which this country has a very difficult thing with. You know, I'm black and born here and there are many places in this country where I am not welcomed, right? Um, and so the concept of understanding that people are in a threat is something that needs to be an American cultural conversation that talks about all types of people who are considered other because even people who have achieved American citizenship, as long as they are of some other nationality before, they're still like, oh, well, not really. And that's really an educational thing that we need to have here because our country is built on people who are from someplace else that achieved American citizenship. And so if you're not an immigrant and your parents are an immigrant and someone before them was either an immigrant by choice or not by choice, so this sort of right to belonging is the thing that we grapple with, this sort of thing of how you speak on behalf of the American when the American is the melting pot, allegedly. I mean, 
I would, I would say that we, we need all of the above in terms of an approach because ne neither one on its own is going to solve the problem. I think what's interesting, what I've seen is when you talk to individuals, they will tell you they love the immigrants that they know, right? The ones that they've interacted with, their own family members, perhaps, or just people in their communities. But there's something about that other immigrant, the one they don't know that they've only seen in pictures that are personified in a certain way in the national narrative. And so I think it's important for us on the grassroots level, community levels, business levels to constantly be pushing back against anything that seems to be othering immigrants or making it about a fixed pie. Right? You've got to be able to, to, to continue to grow because right now that's in our that works in our benefit. Those of us who want to see immigration form, the fact that people do connect either to their own history or to immigrants that they know. But we do then at the same time need grass top and political leaders who stop the really divisive narratives and, and rhetoric that happens on the higher level. And there is a way where those could meet and you can have someone like a Reagan come and lead, uh, uh, you know, in a certain way. People like President Bush recently coming out with his new book and his portraits and talking about the immigrant experiences and how that was one of the regrets of his presidency was not getting that done. I mean, there are ways for leaders um, and I, you know, I know we've talked a lot about Republicans, but even on the Democrat side, for leaders to make sure they don't talk about immigrants as like stealing jobs or a threat to the American worker. They're not. And it, it hurts every time you hear leaders say those things because you need both the grassroots and that leadership at the top if we want to get something done. Jill, I'd love to hear your way in if you're I mean, open to it. I mean, reduce xenophobia and force people to look at the data, right? If you look every single time you see a spike in immigration in the United States, it's followed by a spike in the economy. So look at, you know, if that's too much of a heavy lift for someone in the community to reduce xenophobia and look at data, then I don't really know if we can help them. But um, I do think it's when you're when you're in when you're in a place um, in a city or in a region with more immigrants, um, the perception of immigrants and their threat to, to you um, as a non-immigrant, you know, is, is less. If you're in a place where you're isolated and you don't know many immigrants, then your fear and xenophobia is higher. So I think that that just says we need education, exposure, empathy. <laughs> Everything should be built around empathy for our neighbors um, and the, in the common human experience. Yeah, I actually, I hate to do it, but I, I think that's such a great, a great place to end. And I apologize, we're like coming up on two o'clock. I don't want to hold everyone, uh, but what a great way to end. You know, it's really having these kind of conversations, education, talking, and Jill, I 100% agree with you, like empathy. Uh, we really could use a little bit more of that in our society across the board. Um, I want to thank all of you, uh, Jill, Charles, Alan, Jorge, thank you so much for being part of this panel. It was an incredible discussion uh, and we loved having you here with us today. Uh, I think, I think what we can see uh, as, as we've gone through the summit is that immigration reform is such a complex and tenuous issue. And um, it's through conversations like these, it's through these gatherings that, that we begin to start chipping away at, at some of the roadblocks to reform and really moving towards more meaningful and impactful solutions. Um, I think we all know there is still so much work to be done, uh, but I like I would hope uh, most of our panelists, I'm so hopeful. And um, we are at the Rational Middle. We invite you to visit rationalmiddle.com. You can watch our films. You can listen to our weekly podcasts. You can learn more about today's speakers and our guests, as well as future events, which we will promise to keep doing. Uh, and more importantly, uh, you, you can have a place to continue the conversation. And that is what we truly want. This has been such an incredible event. Uh, I want to thank again our keynote, DW, all of our moderators, our panelists, and to all of you out there who joined us today, thank you for being part of the Rational Middle, and we'll see you next time.